Hey, and welcome back to another video. This is the third episode of the story where there are so many things that we as humans are unaware of, or lack an understanding. The bijou are one of those things. Follow the journey of Naruto Uzumaki as he befriends the yokai that was sealed inside of him and, she, helps him grow stronger. Please support by liking and subscribing. Let's start the show. It was the start of a new year at the Shinobi Academy. Naruto, clad in his orange monstrosity and with a large grin on his chibified whiskered face, ignored the glares and scowls sent his way as he ran towards the academy. When he got to the room with the number of his classroom on it he slammed the door open and walked in. Several of the other students who were already inside looked over to see who had made such a loud entrance, several of those people became blinded by the bright orange jumpsuit the blonde was wearing, and more than a few wondered if Naruto wasn't colorblind. Why else would he wear such a hideous bright color? Naruto ignored all of this as he kept his grin on, walking towards an empty seat in the back where he could observe the class. He sat down and spent the rest of the time keeping his idiot grinficate up while discreetly looking at any and all of the noteworthy students in the classroom. Out of all 26 students besides himself, Naruto saw seven that stood out the most. Seated over the front left-hand corner of the room with a bored look on his face was a kid that could pass off as a younger Itachi. He had raven black hair that was spiked at the back and oddly enough, reminded the blonde of a duck's ass. He was wearing white shorts, blue shinobi sandals and a blue Uchiha-style shirt with his clan crest on the back. Currently, he was looking out of the window while all of the girls in the class gave him a dreamy stare. Must be Sasuke, Itakinizen's younger brother, Naruto thought, remembering a few times Itachi had told him about his brother when he took Naruto out for ramen. In the middle row on the right were two more that caught his attention. A tall kid with fairly long jet black hair tied in a spiky ponytail, narrow brown eyes that had a lazy half-lidded expression to them. His attire was rather plain, consisting of a green-lined mesh t-shirt under a short-sleeved gray jacket with green edges, adorned on both the sleeves and the back with a circle with a line through it, brown pants, and blue sandals. Definitely a Nara, Naruto frowned in thought as he brought up the information he knew on the Nara clan. If I had to guess, I'd say it's the son of the current clan head Shikaku, if he's anything like the notes on Shikaku that my old man left then he'll be the purest definition of lazy genius. I remember them, Akane piped in, even when they had first joined Kanoha that clan was the laziest bunch of people I had ever seen. They make the Sanbai appear hard work, and that damn turtle is the laziest son of a bitch I ever knew. Naruto snorted in laughter at her comment, causing several people to look at him. He ignored them and continued his observations. Next to the Nara was what could only be an Akimichi. The kid was very large, a necessity for the Akimichi due to their clan techniques, and had brown hair, and swirl marks on his cheeks. He wore brown shorts, a rather long white scarf, a short-sleeved green jacket. Over a white shirt with the kanji for food, shoku, on it, ring earrings, and his legs and forearms were wrapped in bandages. If the Nara is the son of Shikaku, I'll go on a limb and say that this kid is the heir for the Akamichi clan. A little ways away from the two clan heirs was a girl that caught his attention. The girl's most noticeable trait in her appearance were her blue eyes and her long blonde hair, which was currently cut shoulder length and had two short bangs framing her face. Her attire consisted of a short purple vest-like shirt with a raised collar, a skirt that was cut off on the sides and bandages on her stomach and legs. She also wore purple and white elbow warmers with this. She was obviously a member of the Yamanak clan, the only other people in Kanoha with blonde hair and blue eyes like himself. He had to wonder about why someone who was only eight years old would wear clothing that revealed so much skin. It's not like she has anything to show off, thought Naruto, his mind strained to Akane. Before a blush could make its way to his face he continued his surveillance of the room. Several seats from Naruto himself was a brown-haired kid who had a wild appearance to him, giving him some traits that were akin to an animal. He had messy brown hair, sharp black eyes with vertical slit-like pupils, pronounced canine teeth, and nails that looked slightly clawed. 
He also had the distinct red fong markings of the Inazuka clan on his cheeks. Sum's kid, Naruto decided with certainty, remembering the few times he had seen the woman around the village. She was one of the few people that was actually nice to him. His attire consisted of dark grayish pants reaching to his calves and a gray, hooded fur-lined coat. On top of his head sat a small white puppy that only confirmed the boy's Inazuka heritage in Naruto's mind. Another to catch his attention was a girl with dark blue hair, fair skin and white eyes, with a tinge of lavender. The eyes were completely pupilless, meaning she belonged to the Hyuga clan, one of the most prominent clans in Kanoha and the rivals of the Uchiha clan. Her hair was in a hindcut style, with chin-length strands framing her face. She wore a cream-colored hooded jacket with a fire symbol on the upper right and left sleeves and fur around the cuffs and hem, with navy blue pants. Naruto was kind of amused to see that the girl looked completely intimidated by everyone around her, as evidenced by how she seemed to be trying to hide in her jacket. That, or she was just attempting to do her best impression of a turtle. The last person to really catch his attention was the boy sitting right next to him. This kid had dark bushy brown hair, pale skin, and seemed to be the tallest kid in class, besides himself when he was out of his transformation. His clothing consisted of dark sunglasses and a sea-green jacket with a high, upturned collar and a hood that was currently brought up to hide most of himself from the class. Naruto heard a light buzzing coming from him and assumed he was an aburain, a clan that utilized bugs to fight. The only other person that was caught his attention was a girl with bright pink hair and an abnormally large forehead. Cause I mean really, what kind of shinobi had pink hair? The door opened and two people walked in, the two chunin instructors Naruto assumed. The first was a man with brown hair that was kept in a ponytail, dark eyes and a scar across the bridge of his nose. He was wearing the standard Kanoha shinobi outfit complete with forehead protector, sandals and flak jacket. The other was a man with white, shoulder-length hair was in a bandana-style forehead protector and the standard Kanoha shinobi outfit. All right class settle down, the brown-haired man said. The class seemed to quiet down, eagerly awaiting their introduction into the shinobi world. My name is Irika Yumino and this is my assistant Mizuk, Mizuki seemed to scowl slightly at the man's words but only Naruto caught it, I would like to welcome all of you to the start of your first year in the Shinobi Academy. Each one of you is here because they wish to serve and protect Kanoha as a ninja, and we will do our best to ensure that you all become the best ninja you can be. Many of the students seem to smile at this. Now, when I call your name I want you to come up to the front and introduce yourself by telling us what your reasons are for being a Shinobi. Aburaim, Shino. One by one the students were called, Naruto ignored all but eight of them. The seven clan heirs, all of whom were from the most prominent bloodline clans of Kanoha and the pink-haired girl who he felt might prove useful in keeping with appearances. It seems like this is going to be an interesting class with so many prominent clan members in it, Naruto thought to himself. Uzumaki. Naruto. Naruto looked up and saw the look of hatred on both Mizuki's face, and the look of distaste on Irika's. This is going to be a long four years, the blonde figured as he walked down to the front. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, the blonde shouted with his wide grin, and I'm going to become the greatest Hokage so that people will look up to me and respect me. Dedebeo his proclamation was met with several minutes of stunned silence before the entire class started laughing uproariously. Yep, definitely a long four years, Naruto held in a sigh as he went back up to his seat, I wonder how the boss is doing. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf, Hey Narutakun Akane said as Naruto continued going through the katas of the Kitsunikan Taijutsu style. Two years filled with long hours of practice had ensured that Naruto now had the movements down by muscle memory, all he had to do now was work out the kinks and improve his physical fitness. Yeah, asked Naruto with a grunt as he flew through a particular fast kata where he struck his imaginary opponent with lightning-fast knife-edged jabs to where the floating ribs would be located. Moving back out he jumped in the air and spun around and did a heel kick that would have hit his now-disabled opponent in the neck. 
Landing back on the ground he continued his katas. I was thinking, with how much traveling you're going to be doing it may be a good idea to find a way to earn money. I was thinking about that too, 10,000 yen is quite a bit of money, but it won't last forever. Naruto paused as he made several kicking combinations, switching from his left to his right foot all the while spinning on the balls of whichever foot he was standing on at that given moment. I was thinking of selling my seals, not only do I have a lot of seal designs but most of the seals that I found at the ninja stores were complete crap. Akane listened with no small amount of amusement as Naruto went on a rant about the terrible quality of the seal paper, ink and the seals themselves. The paper they use is completely shoddy, what with all the creases the paper has, not to mention the poor quality of it. The ink has absolutely no special properties and tends to fade within a year and don't even get me started on the seals themselves, it's like a fucking child drew them. The redhead decided not to mention that technically, Naruto was considered a child. Instead just listening to him talk about something he obviously held a passion for, even if she had no clue what he was talking about. I have nothing against you selling your seals, that can actually be a pretty lucrative business since very few people can make them. Akane paused, of course, you should keep all of your more powerful seals to yourself, that way they don't get into the hands of someone who may be inclined to use them against you. Also, we'll need to find a way to protect your seals so no one else can copy them before we sell your customized ones. That's why I'm going to start hiding my seals into specific designs, like the Uzumaki clan symbol, Naruto told her. It was common practice for a seal master to hide his seals within something, like the Shiki Fujin, dead demon consuming seal, on his stomach that was in the design of the Uzumaki clan symbol. That's a good idea, I would suggest making some more clones to get to work on that right now so you can begin making money soon. Having already been thinking along the same lines of the vixen Naruto created 50 more clones with orders to begin finding a way to disguise his seals. Half an hour later Naruto ended his taijutsu kata and walked over to where he had set down his towel, picking it up and wiping the sweat off his body. All right, on the ceiling, it's time for your kenjutsu training. Naruto sighed as he grabbed his bakken and did as told, it was going to be a long night. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf All Right Class Iruka called out he finished his lecture on the Shodame Hokage, a boring lecture on the man's Mokutan, would release, Jutsu and how he founded the village, at least it was boring in Naruto's opinion. I want all of you to head outside to the training logs with Mizuki, it's time to begin target practice. The class all scrambled out of their seats excitedly, Naruto included as they ran outside. They met Mizuki who looked at all of them, scowling at Naruto before he began giving instructions on what to do. When I call your name I want you to take these kanai and throw them at the training post, he said, looking down at his clipboard, Aburaim, Shino. One by one they all went up, most did terribly, very few kids hit the log, most of their throws going wide. Though there were a few lucky hits. The ones who did good were the clan heirs, well most of them. Shino, Kiba and Sasuke all did well enough, with Shino getting 9 out of 10, Kiba getting 7 out of 10 and Sasuke getting all 10, even deciding to show off by throwing them all at once, much to the excitement of his fangirls. Ino, Choji, Hinata and Shikimaru, however, did not do as good. Ino got 3 out of 10, not only was her aim completely off but her throws were weak, Choji got 5 out of 10, which wasn't bad and he had strength behind his throws, but lacked accuracy, Hinata's hand was shaking so hard that she only managed to get 2 out of 10, and left with her head in her jacket to hide her embarrassment, and Shikimaru didn't even try, claiming it was too troublesome and ended up getting a 0 out 10. Uzumaki Naruto Mizuki said, and only Naruto caught the light growl in his voice, it made the blonde wonder why this man hated him so much. Hey! Hey Securikan! Watch how awesome I am! Naruto shouted to the pink-haired girl, Sakura Haruno, a girl who was wearing a red chipao dress with white circular designs, with or without sleeves, tight dark green shorts. After the first two months of the new year, Naruto had decided to use this girl to keep up with appearances, acting like he had a crush on her. Shut up Naruto no baka. 
Sakura shouted as her face turned the same color as her hair. She shook her fist at him in a violent manner, something she always did when he was not close enough to hit. The girl was one of Sasuke's biggest fan girls, along with Ino Yamanaka who Naruto felt was a disappointment to her clan due to how she seemed more concerned with Sasuke than being a better ninja. Because the pink-haired girl was a civilian and extremely violent she was the perfect cover for Naruto's idiot persona. Naruto walked up to where Mizuki was and took the kunai from him, absently noting that they were so dull even if he hit the target they were unlikely to stick, unless he used chakra to strengthen his throws. Not that it mattered since he wasn't trying to hit the targets. Pretending to take careful aim with each kunai the blonde, orange-clad genin missed each one. Everyone around him laughed and began to make fun of him, since even the civilian children got at least one. Naruto pretended to get angry at how all the kids were laughing, and moved back into the crowd. The class soon went back inside ere Irika began another lecture. Naruto sighed, Kami I hate the boss. I wish he were here instead of me. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf The months passed by in a blur for Naruto as he continued his training, increasing the number of clones he could make from 200 to 300. Once again this increase in Kage Bunshin also produced a remarkable increase in the amount of jutsu he learned. He was very proud of his accomplishments and couldn't wait until the day that he could show everyone how truly powerful he was. He had also finally finished working on his seal designs, having decided to hide them within a symbol he had made himself. The symbol was essentially the Uzumaki clan symbol, except that it was done in a way that looked like the swirl was made of a fox tail. The tail was subtle enough that people would likely never realize what kind of animal it was, even if they bothered to actually look at the seal when they used it. Now, all he had to do was find a store that he could sell his seals from. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf A young man who looked to be around 18 years old with spiky red hair that had two jaw-length bangs framing his face and a spiky fringe that covered his forehead was walking down one of the many streets of Kanoha. He had dark, purple eyes, a rarity in any country and was fairly tall, standing at six foot five and had an athletic build that spoke of long hours of training. He was wearing what looked like ronin samurai clothing, a traditional dark blue kimono with a pair of black hakama-style pants underneath. His footwear consisted of tabi socks and waraji sandals. He was very handsome, with a chiseled face that held a roguish charm to it. In fact, if one were to look at his general face shape and hairstyle, they would almost assume he was the Yandame Hokage, were it not for the red hair and purple eyes. The smile he wore made several of the women near him swoon, causing the men around him to scowl. Not that he was paying any attention to the people around him. The young man was too busy spending time looking at all of the stores, trying to find a good store to sell his wares to notice the drooling looks the women were giving him or the scathing scowls the men were sending. Let's see Kinsei's Hoisoi Haiki, Kinsei's Fine Weapons, nope. Shinobi Chu, Shinobi Central, a bunch of assholes that I ain't helping, the young man sighed. Geez, there doesn't seem to be any Shinobi stores around here that I want to sell my seals to. Oh, what's this? He had stopped in front of a nondescript building, with the only decoration being a kunai and the titles Higarashi's weapon shop on top of the entrance. Curious, the young man entered the shop. Looking around the first thing the young man noticed was that the place was easily a shinobi's wet dream, lined all around the walls and on several stands in the store. Were some of the most beautiful and well-crafted weapons he had ever seen. Everything from axes and lances, to ninjatos, he even saw a few broad swords that were said to have been imported from the east many years ago during the Second Great Ninja War. The place was obviously a store that took their job to supply ninja with the proper tools seriously. Can I help you? Turning the red-haired young man was soon staring at a bull of man. Large and built like brick shit house. The man had muscles on every part of his body that the redhead could see, he even had muscles on his muscles. He had dark, spiky brown hair and brown eyes, and was wearing an off-white shirt, brown pants and a pair of brown boots. Maybe, the young redhead said with an easy-going grin. 
I was actually here because I saw your store and was hoping that the two of us may be able to enter a partnership for mutual benefit. Oh, the large man said with interest. The redhead nodded, this is a beautiful store, and I've noticed that all of the weapons you have are top quality, as well as your shinobi clothing and armor. However, I was wondering if you sold seals. And if so, how good they are. You make seals, asked the large man, sounding both curious and interested. The redhead smirked, yep, I've been traveling the elemental nations learning what I can about the art of fuenjutsu. I've been hoping to find a place to sell my seals, but very few stores here seem to really know good quality when they see it. There are a lot of stores that sell cheap equipment, the large man agreed. A moment later he stuck out his hand, Kaizuki Higarashi. The redhead took the offered hand in a firm hand shake and smiled, Erisher Kazama. Kaizuki nodded, I take it you have your seals with you. Erisher nodded, then follow me to the back, show me what you have and if I like your stuff, then we can cut a deal. Kaizuki-san, I like the way you think. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf It was nearly two hours later that Erisher left the Hijirashi weapons shop, both him and Kaizuki being satisfied with the deal they had cut. The large weapons store owner had been very impressed with the quality of Arashi's seals, which as far as he could tell were near flawless. It took a while but in the end they had both settled on an agreement each could work with. Arashir would supply Kaizuki's store with all of the standard seals, and any new seals he came up with would go exclusively to the Hijirashi weapons store. In return, Kaizuki had offered the man the better end of the bargain, giving Arashir a 60% cut of the profit on all the seals sold. It had originally been 50-50, but after Arashir mentioned that he was also using his own custom-made paper and ink, both of which were costly to make, the man had given him the better offer, knowing that if the red head went to another store it may decrease his own sales. As he closed and locked the door to the hotel that he had rented. Out, Erisher gave a loud yawn while stretching his hands above his head. Long day. Erisher snorted at the voice before a ripple spread across his skin, his hair went from red to gold, his eyes from purple to blue, he shrunk down to a height of four feet six inches and his clothing changed to all black shinobi clothing. It was definitely different than a standard day, that's for sure, Naruto said as he looked around the nice hotel room. He moved towards the kitchen where he began looking into the fridge to see if there was anything good to eat, not finding much he sighed, and decided he would use his Erisher persona and go out and get something to eat a little later. For now, he would just go into the seal and spend some time with Akane. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf We must strike now Hiruzen, stated an old frail-looking man, who had one hand holding onto a cane. He had black shaggy hair, and his right eye was kept bandaged. He had an shaped scar on his chin, a scar that had been given to him during his youth. He wore a white shirt, with a brown robe over top of it covering from his feet, to just over his right shoulder. The robe conceals his right arm which was bandaged, and covered with three big golden braces. Hiruzen Sarutobi gave an exasperated sigh at his old friend, we can still work on negotiations with them, Danzo. Why are you so adamant about killing members of our own village when all this can be avoided without the need for senseless bloodshed? Danzo nearly scowled at the man he had once called friend, ever since Sarutobi became the Hokage he had become jealous of the man who he felt was too weak to be a good Hokage clinging to the ideals of peace that the show and Naidame Hokages had also clung to. He couldn't help but think that if he were Hokage, none of the problems they had now would be an issue. Known as an old, war hawk, Danzo was an extremist who preferred to directly eliminate threats through assassination and execution rather than diplomacy and negotiation. He possessed a fanatical adherence to the ideals of a shinobi, believing they must sacrifice absolutely everything for the village. You've been talking with them for nearly four months now Sarutobi, he said, resisting the urge to scowl as he had to keep his reputation of being emotionless up. How long will it take you to realize that Fugaku is not interested in talking? For the past four months the Uchiha clan had been behaving suspiciously, their shinobi were acting weary and secretive. 
In fact, ever since the Kyubi attack things with the Uchiha clan had been tense, most people remembered that Madara Uchiha had tried to use the Kyubi as a weapon, summoning the beast and attempting to use his eyes to control it when he had battled Hashirima Senju, the Shodame Hokage. No one really knew how the battle went, only that Hashirima had won but later died from his lingering injuries after the Second Shinobi War had started. However, many people Remember the tales of Madara summoning the Kyubi and people wondered if he could summon it, perhaps the rest of the Uchiha clan could as well, making the people weary and suspicious of them. Since the attack nearly nine years ago things had been getting progressively worse, it had even gotten to the point where Saratobi had his most trusted umbu, young Itachi, spy on his own family. What the child prodigy had found was disturbing. Hiruzen, I know you dislike bloodshed, especially in our own village, Koharu, an old lady who had her hair pulled back in a twin bun locked by a traditional Japanese hair pin with two pearls dangling off the side and tassels that were added at the end. She wore a simple long kimono, closed by an obi, a jacket, and a sash over it. She had squinting eyes that were barely open at any point in time. However, the Uchiha clan is planning a coup, do you really think you can negotiate with them when they're so far along in their plans? Despite, or perhaps because of her old age, Kaharu was a very assertive and strong-willed woman. She held on to the belief that the group is more important than any of its individual members, which often clashed with the third Hokage's view. Being much more militant than the Hokage she served under, the old woman tended to lean more towards Danzo's way of thinking. Surely even you can see that trying to settle this with peaceful negotiation is impossible, said the final member of their little group. Hamura was an aging man with grey hair, a beard, glasses as well as a constant frown that he always seemed to wear, even in his youth. He also had a strong jawline and facial structure he managed to retain even in his old age. As a member of the Kanoha Council, he wore similar garb to those that Hiruzen would when acting in his capacity as Hokage. Hamura was an authoritarian and always had the village's best interests in mind. Like Koharu, he was more militant than the Hokage he served under, and as such often leaned more toward Danzo's point of view. Sarutobi sighed as he was triple teamed, he was unsure what to do, he disliked having to shed blood, especially the blood from members of his own village. Yet at the same time, he knew that they were nearly out of options. Hokage-sama, I am willing to accomplish this task. All heads turned to Itachi Uchiha, who had been patiently standing off to the side, having been the one who had just given them this information. Itachi, can you really be thinking of doing something like this? Of killing your own clan, asked Sarutobi, shock permeating his features. Itachi closed his eyes and a small look of pain swept his features as he remembered the Third Great Ninja War. He remembered the countless lives that had been lost due to all of the pointless bloodshed, ever since he had seen war firsthand, the young Uchiha had become a staunch pacifist and supporter of the Sandame's beliefs. However, he knew that if avoiding bloodshed was not possible, then the best way to save the innocent was squash any form of violence as brutally and efficiently as possible. Opening his eyes he looked at his Hokage, I believe this may be the only way to avoid even more bloodshed. If the Uchiha clan succeeds in attempting this coup de tot, win or lose, Kanoha will be weakened, and the other hidden villages will descend upon us like a plague of locusts. You have a point, Hiruzen gave a tired sigh, it was times like these that he truly felt his age. Itachi Uchiha, I am giving you the mission of exterminating the Uchiha clan before they can plan their coup de tot. You are to carry this out immediately. Hi, Hokage-sama. Itachi said with a bow before disappearing in a swirl of leaves. Itachi would do as ordered, but he had one stop to make before then. Story of the ten-tailed wolf Naruto Uzumaki was woken by a loud knock on his door, grumbling he got out of bed and made his way into the living room, transforming into his chibi look as walked. Opening the door he blinked the sleep out of his eyes as he saw Itachi standing in front of him, Naruto could immediately tell something was wrong. Are you all right Itakiniazan? asked Naruto, adopting an expression of concern. Yes, I am fine Narutokun, Itachi said with a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes, do you mind if I come in? 
Not at all, Naruto moved out of the way so Itachi could enter his apartment. The two of them moved into the kitchen slash living room, Itachi sat down on the couch while Naruto sat down on the chair. So why are you visiting me so late at night? Itachi didn't answer right away, instead taking a moment to look around the room. He had been in Naruto's apartment several times now, and it never ceased to both amaze and annoy him that the blonde who had become like a brother similar to Sasuke was given such a terrible, run-down dump. It was the one thing he hated about Konoha. That they would treat their hero with such disrespect. Shaking his thoughts off he looked over at Naruto, circumstances are going to be forcing me to leave the village soon. He saw the blonde tilt his head at the cryptic remark, thankfully the blonde knew better then to interrupt. Therefore, before I leave, I wanted to give you something, and I would like to make a request of you. Um, okay, Naruto replied, wondering if he should ask Itachi why he was going to leave. First, from the front left pocket of his flak jacket, Itachi pulled a scroll from inside and tossed it over to Naruto. That scroll contains the knowledge of every jutsu I have ever learned, there are over 500 in there. The raven-haired Sunba trader smirked at the boy's jaw-dropped expression, I know you are stronger than you let on Naruto-kun. The mere fact that you can evade every Umbu officer who chases after you for hours on end tells me you have more talent than you show. Hehe, <laughs> Naruto scratched the back of his head as a sheepish smile came to his face. I guess it was stupid to think I could fool you. Does anyone else know? No, Itachi shook his head, even the Hokage doesn't seem to know that you are much more than you appear. You are very good at hiding yourself in plain sight when you don't want people to see you. Thank you, Naruto said, looking at the scroll with excitement, who knew what secrets this scroll contained. What was your request? As I said before I will be leaving the village soon, and I fear that Sasuke will be in trouble, Itachi started, you know my little brother right? Yeah, my class, arrogant attitude, black eyes, black hair in the shape of a duck's ass, Naruto said absently. I know him, the blonde looked over at Itachi, you want me to befriend him or something? You know I already tried that, right? Itachi winced as he remembered the days he made the suggestion that Sasuke might be a good friend for Naruto. His little brother had simply stated that their father had said the whiskered blonde was nothing but a monster and that he could not be trusted, going even further to state that was clanless orphan like Naruto wasn't worth befriending. I do apologize for that, I was hoping he would not follow in our father's footsteps, Itachi could understand Sasuke's attitude since he desired to prove himself to their father. But he had hoped that his little brother's desire wouldn't cause him to blindly follow their father. That's okay, I guess, Naruto said with an indifferent shrug of his shoulders, I've gotten used to being hated by now. He got another wince from the raven-haired Anbiu, do you know why I'm hated Itakiniazen? I. Itachi paused, before really thinking about what he should say, he had no desire to lie to the young blonde who had already suffered so much. Yet at the same time he could not disobey a direct order from the Hokage. I am sorry Naruto-kun, while I do know why you are hated, I am afraid that I can't tell you. Can't. Or won't. Naruto already knew why he was hated of course, but wanted to test Itachi since he was the only person who treated Naruto like a human besides Akanakan, the Ichirakus, and Sarutobi. That, and he had to keep up appearances, Itachi may know he was stronger than he let on but even he didn't know how strong, or that the Kyubi was helping him. Can't, Itachi said, there is, there is a law put in place, any who speak of the reason you are hated besides yourself or the Hokage are to be sentenced to instant death. Fat lot of good that did, thought Naruto as he remembered all of the beatings he had in the past. He had seen every single one of the people he remembered beating him the next day as if they had done nothing wrong. I suppose there's nothing to it then, deciding to move on he asked, so what was it that you wanted me to do? I want you to keep an eye on Sasuke, Itachi said, I fear that thanks to our father he will walk the path of our ancestor and when I am gone there will be no one around. To make sure he does not fall to darkness. Well, I don't know if I can keep him from falling, Naruto said, but quickly added, however, I will do my best to keep him in the village. That's all I can ask, Itachi said, standing up. 
I hope that someday we can meet again Imuto. Later. Itakini isn't, Naruto said as Itachi blurred out of existence. What do you think? Something is going to happen tonight, Akane said, knowing what he was talking about, I can feel it. I believe something bad is going to happen, and going by what Itachi is saying, it's going to happen to the Uchiha clan. Good riddance, thought Akane, being careful to keep her feelings from entering the seal. She had never liked the Uchiha clan, after Madara had tried to turn her into a slave. She hadn't put up with that of course, and was the real reason that Madara was dead. She could tell you from personal experience that cooked Uchiha did not taste like chicken. Do you think we should see what's up? No. Shouted Akane, before in a quieter voice saying, Trust me, whatever is going to happen is happening because of forces beyond you. And you don't want to be around when whatever happens happens, people may try to link you to whatever went on and that would not be good. Yeah, I guess you're right, he said slowly. Of course I am, now come into the seal. We'll find out what happened to the Uchiha clan tomorrow. Story of the ten-tailed wolf like Akane had said Naruto discovered what happened to the Uchiha clan that early that morning as he was traveling on his way to school. Did you hear? They say the Uchiha clan was massacred last night. I wonder if it was the demon. That's what I thought too, but apparently it was one of their own. Yeah, Itachi Uchiha, the ANBU prodigy. Naruto continuously channeled chakra into his ears as he listened into every conversation on his way to the academy. Itachi Uchiha had killed the entire Uchiha clan in one night, minus his little brother Sasuke. Naruto now knew what his brother figure meant when he said Sasuke might stray down the path of his ancestor. The boy might very well become a liability to the village or emotionally unbalanced if even half of the stories of the torture Sasuke went through were real. Class that entire day was a subdued affair as news of the Uchiha's destruction spread, Naruto noticed that Sasuke was not in class and couldn't help but wonder what happened to him. Out of all the things I could have imagined Itachi doing, I never thought he would destroy his own clan, Naruto thought absently. He likely had a good reason for it, Itachi had been the one Uchiha that Akane had respected, the one she had ever seen that had not given into the darkness of his cursed eyes. What reason could he possibly have for killing off his clan, asked Naruto incredulously. He may not have liked the Uchiha clan, hell. He hated that clan. But to just kill them off was wrong. Perhaps they were going up against the Hokage. I know you don't like killing Naruto-kun, but the Uchiha clan is a clan full of traitors, they would betray you in a heartbeat if it granted them power. Naruto frowned, you sound as if you have personal experience with them. Oh I do, Akane muttered darkly, Madara team tried to use me in his battle with the Shodame at the Valley of the End. Idiot thought he could use his eyes to control me, laugh but I showed that bastard that I am not to be reckoned with. Wait, 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 are you telling me that you were at the battle between Madara and the Shodame? Akane snorted, the Shodame only battled for like an hour, when Madara realized he was losing he somehow managed to summon me and then he tried to take control of me. Even to this day Akane still didn't know how that man had managed to summon her, she assumed it was some kind of space-time ninjutsu, but since she didn't know a whole lot about human techniques she had never been sure. I was the one who killed him. Iruka Sensei would die if he learned that the Shodame didn't kill Madara, Naruto thought jokingly. Meh, I told him to only mention me in passing, by that time people had forgotten the truth about us Bijou and many only wanted to use us for weapons. That, or they feared us for our power. I guess. Naruto was silent for a moment before curiosity got the better of him and he asked, So you know Madara well? Knew, I knew him, decently, Akane said. I didn't know much about the man personally, I had only met him a few times when he came to try and convince me to side with him against Kanoha. However, I do know his clan very well. Really? Yes, after all, I'm the one who created the Uchiha clan. Naruto was so shocked by her words that he fell of his chair in surprise. 
Getting up he rubbed the back of his head sheepishly as he caught the attention of several of his classmates, most just snorted and ignored him, or laughed at him however, since his reputation as a prankster and idiot was already well known it didn't bother him. You created the Uchiha clan, asked Naruto once he had gotten back in his seat and managed to move through his shock. Yes, Akane said, seeing no reason to hide it. It was around 1000 years ago that I gave the first Uchiha his Sharingan eyes, it was during one of the many wars that myself and the other bijou found themselves in. This war however, was far different from the one you know of as Shinobi Wars. Naruto found himself fascinated by the story and had to ask, what made this war so different? Because this war was not human against human, this war was a battle of demons versus humans. Naruto was shocked by her answer, but kept quiet while she talked. At the time demons were much more plentiful and the portals to the underworld were not closed like they are today, myself, along with the other bijou led the war against the demons who had threatened our lands. Wait. Aren't you and the other bijou demons as well, asked Naruto, why side with humans? We may be demons Naruto-kun, but we are far different than the average demon. There was a prolonged pause before the demoness voice was heard again, my kind were created by the gods themselves, each one took on an aspect of our master, the one who created us. I was created by Inarisama, the god of foxes, therefore my demon form is that of a fox and I am gifted with a cunning intelligence and love of pranks. The nine of us were sent down here by Kami, who gave us the job of protecting her creations. Demons are generally formed from the souls of the damned whose hate burned so strongly they took on the form of monsters. They are not created by Kami or any other of the other gods. We were different and it was those differences and our duty to protect Kami's creations, namely humans, that made us join the humans in battle. However, we could not triumph alone, and though we had a large number of humans at our beck and call who fought alongside us, we were steadily being pushed back by the sheer numbers of our enemies. We realized that without more power the humans would never win, and we couldn't use our demon forms for fear of hurting those who served under us. It was decided then that we would choose champions for our cause, we would grant humans we felt were worthy with some form of power that would give them an edge in battle, this is actually how the first bloodlines were formed. I myself created the Sharingan and gave it to a man who would go on to found the Uchiha clan. Wow, so then, why do you hate the Uchiha clan so much? You mean aside from the fact that Madara tried to use me for his own purposes, asked Akane, getting a small blush of embarrassment from Naruto. I dislike the clan because of what it had become. The Uchiha clan of today is arrogant and have a sick sense of superiority, believing that they are Kami's gift to man and are the only ones fit for the right to rule. It makes me sick just thinking about how corrupted they have become. Aside from that. Akane's voice became far softer and held a regretful tint to it. I know from your memories that it was members of the Uchiha clan who hurt you the most during your childhood. It's okay, Akanakan, Naruto said, knowing she felt guilty for what they did. I don't blame you and truthfully, I couldn't care less about what happened in the past. In fact, I would thank the people who hurt me because it brought you to me. Akane blushed a pretty shade of pink, and was very grateful that Naruto was not in the seal with her to see it. She mumbled a, thank you, just as Iruka and Mizuki entered the door and the lesson began. Story of the ten-tailed wolf a year soon came and went, Naruto continued to play the fool in front of everyone. After what had been dubbed the Uchiha massacre things seemed to get even worse than before for the blonde, he no longer let the umbu catch him. As he played his pranks, and had taken to using a different room in the abandoned apartment complex that he lived in because the attacks on him became more frequent. Sasuke had become even worse since that day, before he was just extremely arrogant and always loved to show off. However, ever since Itachi massacred his own clan the raven-haired academy student became dark, broody and emo. He refused to talk to anybody, and the few who tried were either ignored outright, or verbally abused by the last loyal Uchiha as the Kanoha population had dubbed him. 
It didn't help that the civilians in Kanoha Council started sucking up to the broody revenge-driven boy, many likely only doing so in the hopes that they could convince Sasuke to marry their daughters in order to gain more power through being part of a clan. Naruto was unsure if that was the main reason for the increase in the Sasuke fan club, or if the girls in his class thought they could heal his wounded soul, but Naruto had overheard several of the civilian council members who had daughters in his class to try and convince them to gain favor with the Uchiha. As for Naruto. Give me a futon jutsu. Naruto sped through several hand seals, ending on the horse seal. He took in a deep breath before spitting out a compact ball of wind. The wind ball shot forward at high speed, striking one of the many training dummies in the training field they were using. Like all jutsu the blonde used, Akane made him do this one silently. A katan jutsu. His hands nothing more than a blur, the blonde ran through the gauntlet as he ran through the seals for the jutsu he wanted to do. Taking in a deep breath Naruto blew out a large fire dragon that roared out in what sounded like rage before it charged one of the training dummies, it hit the dummy and exploded, leaving nothing more than ash in its wake. He had continued his training, pushing himself past the limits that normal humans could go in an effort to get stronger. This year, he had gone on a total of 100 bandit raids and had actually been forced to fight two C-ranked missing Nin who Naruto had discovered had a bounty in Kanoha's bingo book. He had even managed to get the bounties from the two ninja, using his alias as Erishir Kazama a wandering swordsman with a talent for seals without anyone in Kanoha being the wiser. Even the Sandame, who had actually given Erishir the money for his first bounty had been unable to tell that it was him. Of course, unlike the Henge, Naruto's transformation was actually a genuine transformation, not an illusion and because of that not even a Dejitsu like the Byakugan or the Sharingan could see through it. The only people who could even tell something was off when he used it were demons, and Jinchuriki who had full control over their demons. Otherwise, it was like looking at a regular person. And speaking of his alias, the seals that he had been making and selling had become an amazing source of Income. In order to keep his cover Naruto would make Erisher while out of the village, then have him come in through the north gate, where he was forced to fill in several forms stating his name, age, and reason for visiting. Afterwards, he had his business persona leave, then come back six months later in order to see how much he had made thanks to the seals he had given Kaizuki. Apparently they had been so popular that the man had run out of the seals he had been given about three months after Red had left. Naruto had made a total of 50,000 yen from his first sales. Since then, Naruto made sure that Erisher visited every two months to bring in more seals and had given Kaizuki several of his older custom seals. Now Naruto had not only a steady income, but made more money in one month than most people did in a year. Do a Raitan Jutsu. His fingers moved in perfect synchronization as he continued to train his Jutsu. When he finished, Naruto slammed his hands into the ground and a large bolt of lightning tore through the landscape as it made its way towards the last training dummy on the field. It struck gold, shooting sparks everywhere as the dummy was disintegrated. That's enough training, Akane said, letting Naruto finally slump to the ground from having done four hours of nothing more than shooting jutsu. Even someone who had more chakra than the current Hokage, launching so many jutsu non-stop, within such a short period of time, while having 400 clones working on creating seals and whatever else he decided to have them do elsewhere was exhausting. You're going to need to buy some new training dummies. Naruto snorted, well they are kind of fried. All 200 of them were completely destroyed. I'll send a Kage Bunshin to buy some tomorrow. That's fine, we're done here for now, Akane said, get cleaned up and come into the seal. Okay. Naruto kipped back up to his feet and stretched out. He looked around for a moment at the training ground he was now using. His custom, training ground. Using his Erisher alias Naruto had bought out the apartment complex he was living in, buying it from an aging man who was eager to be rid of the place since no one wanted to live near the demon. With no one else living there Naruto had taken one of the rooms on the first floor as his own, letting his Chishio Bunshin use his to keep up appearances. Naruto's entire apartment room was more along the lines of a mansion-sized flat. 
There were several different sections to the apartment, the training room, the bedroom, the bathroom, living room, kitchen, swimming pool, and the library slash study. Unlike most apartments however, this one had no real walls that separated one section of the house from another, only a staircase that led to where the bed and bathroom was separated from the rest of the house. The section Naruto had just left was the training room, only called that for lack of a better word since no other words could not really apply and that was what he used it for. It was basically just a large expanse of gravel and grass, with one section that held a lot of trees and another that held several bodies of shallow water, the deepest only going about five feet down. It was the largest section of his house and it was here that Naruto practiced his nin, tai, and kenjutsu. The kitchen was just that, a kitchen with stainless steel tops and brand new appliances. Having learned to eat healthy thanks to Akane, the whiskered blonde had gained a fondness for cooking and thus, spared no expense as he bought himself all of the newest appliances. Likewise, the living room was more or less a large carpeted space with several leather sofas and couches, a coffee table and several potted plants to give the room something extra. There wasn't much to the place, and Naruto rarely ever spent time there. His swimming pool was more akin to a lake with a waterfall. It was about about 60 square feet and it had a large waterfall much like the one in his mindscape. The water was continuously being recycled as it went up to the fall through pipes where the water was superheated into steam and purified, before coming down the waterfall as fresh spring water. There was a bridge that ran over the waterfall and it was there that Naruto managed to complete the second step of wind nature manipulation training. His library, which was essentially the Namike's library that he had just transported from his father's house consisted of several large bookcases filled with the near 1,000 scrolls and books that Minato and Kushina had gathered when they were alive. It was near the back of his flat, opposite the training ground and had a large redwood desk so it could double as a study. The last section of the flat was the bedroom and bathroom, which were only separated by a very thin wall for modesty, as if he really needed it since no one came here. The bedroom held a large king-sized bed with soft crimson-colored sheets and several large pillows, a large walk-in closet, the one thing that was actually in an enclosed space, a dresser, nightstand and lamp post, while the bathroom had a large jacuzzi sty tub with two shower heads on either side, a toilet and a sink. The entire apartment room had taken several months to build, not just because Naruto had to have Akane cast a powerful kitsune illusion that she had woven over the building to make people think it wasn't the apartment complex belonging to the Kyubi brat, that way they wouldn't get suspicious when several dozen clones of himself in various henges came in to work on the building. Another reason was because of the seals that went into expanding the interior of his room. During his study in seals Naruto had begun to modify seals in order to suit his purpose at an early stage in his education. One of the seals he created was the expansion seal, taking the concept of the sealing scroll, which created a pocket dimension within a piece of paper and pushing that concept several steps further by creating a pocket space within another space. The apartment that Naruto was currently living in had a total of 12 of these expansion seals, located around the four corners of the first and second floor, and then again in the new corners of the expanded space of the first floor, making the entire flat large enough to hold a decent-sized mansion. Finishing up his shower Naruto spent the rest of the night in the seal, spending time with the woman who had done more for him than any other being alive. With summer coming up she had decided to take it easy on him and give him a rest, telling him more stories of her past and some of the battles she had been in before the bijou were feared. It was midday in Kanoha when two people bearing the forehead protector of Kirigakure no Sato entered the village. That in itself likely would have been considered odd, considering the rumors about the civil war currently happening in Kiri, but it was how much the two contrasted that ended up catching more attention. The person up front was a woman, she looked to be in her mid-twenties and had a slender build. She had ankle-length, auburn hair styled into a herringbone pattern at the back, a top knot tied with a dark blue band, and with four bangs at the front. Two bangs were short, with one covering her right eye, and two were long, crossing each other on her chest, just below her chin. Her eyes were a light green. She was dressed in a long-sleeved dark blue dress that fell down just below the knees. 
It was closed at the front with a zip, and was kept open on the front right side from the waist down. The dress only covered up to the upper part of her arms and the underside of her breasts. Underneath, she was wearing a mesh shirt that covered more of her upper body than her dress, but stopped just short of covering her shoulders and still left a sizable amount of cleavage. She also wore shorts in the same color as her dress and, underneath those, mesh leggings that reached down over her knees. Around her waist, she had on a belt with a pouch attached to the back on the left. Polishing off her ensemble, were a pair of high-heeled sandals and shin guards that reached up over her knees. She also wore dark blue polish on her fingers and toes, and had on dark blue lipstick. The woman was what many men would consider the epitome of beauty, and gave off a cheerful demeanor, which was further enhanced by her beautiful and cheerful smile. Despite this, she carried herself with the grace that could only come from years of being a shinobi, and held herself like an experienced leader. The person beside the woman was a man, who had short tufty blue hair, and dark eyes. He also had pointed, shark-like teeth. He was wearing square, black-rimmed glasses connected to what appeared to be headphones, a blue pinstriped shirt and camouflage patterned pants. He also had on his forehead protector on the front of his holster which he used to carry a large, double-hilted sword. The sword itself is wrapped in bandages leaving only the double hilt visible. He also had shuriken holsters strapped onto each of his legs. However, it wasn't the difference in gender, nor clothes that gave these two such a stark contrast. Where the woman appeared to be the confident and held all the qualities that signified a leader, the man seemed to be shy and held himself in a way that showed a distinct lack in confidence. It was this difference that truly distinguished the two. Sign here please, the voice caught the attention of the two Kiri ninja and they turned to see a pair of chunin, both staring at the auburn-haired woman with glazed over, drooling expressions. The one who had managed to actually speak was holding a clipboard that was at the moment slipping from his grasp, and he had been holding a pen but that had long since fallen to the ground. The woman sighed as her bodyguard grabbed the pen and signed the two of them in, she had long since grown used to such treatment, even with the war in her country she had not escaped some lewd glances. Thankfully, they only came from her enemies, since her own shinobi knew what happened to those who looked at her with such lust-filled eyes. She only wished that she were not on a diplomatic mission here so she could melt the men who couldn't stop stripping her in their minds. Have a good stay. The dumbfounded voice of the Chunin only caused her to snort as she made her way into the village of Kanoha. Taking a look around as she walked, the auburn-haired woman found the village itself was rather beautiful. Trees seemed to litter the entire village, giving its namesake as the village hidden in the leaves a very literal translation. From where she was walking she could easily see the Hokage Monument, a mountain that held the faces of the four leaders of the the village past and present, overlooking the entire village. People of all ages were milling about, playing and talking and just having a good time. The entire village gave off a peaceful aura that one would not have expected from one of the five great shinobi nations, much less the one that was called the strongest. In all honesty she wished her own village was this peaceful. Now if only she could get rid of all the men giving her lecherous stares then it would be perfect. Titarumi sama the blue-haired man asked as they walked through the village, shouldn't we get a place to rest? No, the woman said, I wish to schedule an appointment with the Hokage first. They were already coming up on their destination. The Hokage residence was a large mansion that was located close to both the Ninja Academy and Hokage Monument. It was also the largest building in Kanoha, towering over all other buildings. They entered through the front door and after asking a stuttering and blushing Jonin for directions, took the stairs all the way up to the top floor, where the Hokage's office was located. Walking up to the front desk the auburn-haired beauty coughed to get the female who was manning the desk's attention. The woman looked up and gave her a jealous glare, can I help you? I was hoping that I could schedule an appointment to see the Hokage, the auburn-haired woman said with a pleasant smile. Hold on one moment, the woman walked towards the door and opened it, there was some muffled talking before the woman came back and said, Hokage-sama is available right now. Thank you, she said with a cheerful smile, even as she was thinking about what a bitch the lady was. 
It wasn't her fault she was prettier than the other woman was. Entering the room she took a moment to get her bearings even as she walked up to the desk where Hiruzen Sarutobi, the Sandame Hokage and the man who had been hailed the professor was sitting. She knew not to underestimate the man just because he was old, this was the man who had led a village through two great shinobi wars and was still strong enough to continue leading even after having been retired once. Being very respectful she gave the Hokage a curtsy, doing her best not to let her bust jiggle too much since the old man's eyes seemed to have latched onto it, especially if the light blush on the man's face was anything to go by. Perverted old man, she thought, even as she said, it's a pleasure to meet you Hokage Dano, my name is Mei Terumi. A pleasure to meet you Mei-san, Sarutobi said with a congenial smile, making a concerted effort to take his eyes from her bust. My secretary said you wish to discuss something with me. Yes, Mei replied. Sarutobi nodded, normally I would make some small talk but considering what I have heard of your homeland I don't believe you wish for that. No, Mei agreed, taking a deep breath before plunging on. I have come to request your aid. My people are currently suffering under the yoke of oppression from the Yande Mizukage, Yagura, and the many bloodline clans Kirigakure holds are nearing extinction. As a nation who covets their own bloodlines I'm sure you can appreciate the situation we're in. There was a long pause as Sarutobi took on a deep look of contemplation before speaking, I can certainly sympathize with your people. However, due to the QB attack eight years ago we are still recovering, as of now, I don't have the necessary forces to both protect my village and aid you in the war. I am sorry. Oh, it's all right, May replied, keeping her smile up even as she felt disappointment settling in. She had hoped to gain some support from the bloodline-loving village but it seemed she was wasting her time. Just as she was about to turn around and leave the door burst open, and in walked what, to her, was the most amusing sight she had ever seen. A young boy of about nine years old, with sun-kissed blonde hair, bright blue eyes, a cherub-like face that made him look slightly like a chibi in the cutest whisker-like birthmarks. She had ever seen on his cheeks. Though his clothes left something to be desired. His outfit consisted of an orange tracksuit with blue on the upper shoulders area as well as up and down the front, a white swirl with a tassel on the left side, a red swirl on the back, a big white collar, orange pants, blue sandals and a pair of goggles resting on his forehead. Honestly, what a child was doing in such a horrendous outfit was beyond her. Oi Ajizen. Are you ready to give me that hat now, the whiskered blonde shouted as he stalked into the room, the secretary looking sheepish as she stood in the doorway. I'm so sorry Hokage-sama, she apologized, I tried to tell him you were in a meeting but, it's perfectly all right, Sarutobi placated, I know very well how hard it is to get him not to do something when he's determined. Don't worry, I'll deal with him, the secretary nodded and left. The aging man looked at the grinning blonde, you do know it's rude to interrupt the Hokage when he's in an important meeting Narutokun. Naruto blinked for a few minutes before he rubbed the back of his head and grinned sheepishly, hee hee, sorry Ajizen. He trailed off and eyed Mei, then turned back to the Hokage and asked, hey who's the pretty lady? You're not perving on her are you? What? No, I am not, perving on her. Sarutobi said with a scowl, and a light blush. May actually found herself enjoying the odd and amusing new dynamic the young blonde added to the conversation. Yeah, whatever, you pervy old man, Naruto said. Anyways, I'm making this really cool jutsu and it's gonna be so strong that it'll totally beat you, then you'll have to give me that hat and make me Hokage. Yes, yes, but until you create that jutsu and you manage to beat me, I'm gonna have to ask that you get out of the room until my meeting is concluded, Sarutobi said in a patient voice that told Mei he had done this many times before. Ah. Do I have to? asked Naruto with a whine in his voice. Yes, you have to, Sarutobi said. Fine, suddenly the blonde was pointing a shaking finger at the Hokage, but be prepared to lose that hat the next time I see you. With that said the blonde stalked back out of the room, not even paying attention to Mei or her bodyguard as he slammed the door shut. I'm terribly sorry about him, Sarutobi apologized to Mei. 
He's an orphan of the QB attack and has become something a prankster who enjoys disregarding the rules. That's all right, May said with a dainty shrug, our business was more or less concluded. In fact, since we got an answer I think we'll find a hotel to stay the night and leave first thing tomorrow morning. Very well, Saratobi said, again, I apologize for not being able to help you. May withheld a disappointed sigh, I'm sure. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf crouched down on a building several dozen feet away from the Hokage residence, Naruto watched as the auburn-haired beauty and the blue-haired man with. The sword left and made their way into the city. So what do you think, Akanakan? Hmm, this is definitely an opportunity that we can use to gain some experience, Akane tapped her chin in thought as she looked at the pair through Naruto's eyes. Have a Kage Bunshin tail them so you know where they're going to stay, we don't want to appear just as they leave from their meeting with the Hokage or it'll draw attention. True, and if I'm going to be fighting in a war I'll need to remake my Chishio Bunshin because I have no clue how long I'll be gone. His thoughts in place a clone phased in existence to his left, transforming into a nondescript female and dropping into the alley they were next to. Meanwhile Naruto made his way to his apartment complex. Walking up to his door Naruto placed his hands in a small circle that held a set of seals, which immediately became visible when he channeled some chakra to them. The seals looked similar to his resistance seals, two small circles with an outward pattern that looked like chains. As he began channeling more chakra the chains began to slither and coil around the circle, getting smaller and smaller until they fit within the twin circles perfectly. Opening the door Naruto stepped into his room. The first thing Naruto did was create his Chishio Bunshin, for the last year he had been draining his blood several times a week in order to have a stock ready for when he needed to make his unique form of Bunshin. Grabbing a two-gallon bucket of blood from a hidden pocket space located in a cupboard in his kitchen, Naruto carried it to the training ground where he set it down. Ready? asked Akane. All set, Naruto replied as he placed his hands in the thick, red liquid and began to focus. While both him and Akane began channeling their respected energies, the whiskered blonde was also picturing himself in his mind's eye. Unlike human jutsu, all of Akane's special abilities was based off of intent, there were no hand signs, no shouting out the name of your jutsu, just imagining what you wanted to happen and applying your chakra, or in Akane's case, Yuki. The blood within the bucket began to bubble, climbing into the air slowly it looked like a person sticking their hand out of the red liquid. More and more soon came out, the bucket was knocked over at the blood took shape outside of it. Two legs soon formed, then some feet, two arms and hands followed along with the fingers, toes and the head. The head formed a mouth, a nose and a set of eyes, along with mimicking Naruto's spiky hair. However, it was still blood. Soon enough that began to change, starting from the feet it began to gain skin. It crawled up the figure at a slow pace and as it reached the chest, the skin branched off in three different directions, the arms and head. Finally the jutsu was finished and in front of Naruto stood an exact replica of him. You know what to do, asked Naruto. Of course, don't worry boss, I got it all. Covered, Chishio Naruto said with a smirk. All right then, since it's summer you get free reign, try to cause as much trouble as you can. Chishio Naruto's smirk widened, don't worry, I will. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf Mei Terumi sighed as she finished allowing herself the small luxury of taking a long, hot bath. Now wrapped around in a simple bath robe the young auburn-haired beauty found herself sitting on the couch, sipping some of warm tea. I can't believe I wasted a month-long trip to come here, she muttered as she remembered the meeting she had with the Hokage, even now she felt disappointed, not just in Hiruzen for not helping her but in herself for thinking he would. Ao did try to warn me this might happen, I hope he and the others are all right, just then a knock sounded at the door. May blinked as she stood up and cautiously walked over, who is it? Someone who's heard about your plight and wants to help, a voice sounded from behind the door, making her blink, both at the sound of the voice and the word spoken. May opened the door to see a handsome male with red hair and purple eyes wearing a dark blue kimono, black hakama and tabi socks with waraji standing in the hallway. The man too seemed to be looking at her, 
though May was surprised when no blush came to his face. Now there's something you don't see every day, he commented lightly. This woman was quite easily one of the most beautiful he had ever seen, but compared to Akane's unearthly beauty she was just above average. May looked down and realized she had not changed into her clothes. She found herself blushing rather heavily before she muttered, could you excuse me for a second and shut the door. Getting dressed in her normal clothes, May opened the door again. Now what was it you were saying? I was saying that I had heard about your problems in Kiri and how you were looking for help, the redhead commented, his eyes staying on hers. I have a strong dislike towards those who hold an unreasonable hate for others just because they're different and decided to offer my services to you. I see, May's eyes narrowed, and how did you find out about my request for aid? I have incredible hearing and you were muttering to yourself, he shrugged lightly, something about disappointing old monkeys. Did I really say that? asked May with a blush. You did, pausing May looked at the male before her some more, aside from his extremely handsome good looks, there wasn't much about him that stood out. I hope you don't take offense to me asking, but what can you offer me that would make me want your help? Now came the tricky part, Naruto and Akane had been unsure of just how much information they should give away in order to sell him as someone worth having. In the end, they had agreed that there was one thing they could show that might make her agree. Holding out his hand Naruto summoned his blade, allowing Mei to see the black dado that was unique to him alone. Haidokij no Yaiba, Mei breathed, her eyes as wide as they could go, even if you could only see one of them. She stared at the haired male who had a small smirk plastered on his face, Yorin Uzumaki. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf, Titarumi-sama, are you sure this guy's gonna show up? asked the blue-haired swordsman as he stood at the north gate next to his beautiful leader. Of course I am Chujuro, May replied with a calm air, I told him to be here at eight, we still have ten minutes left. Just be patient. Not wanting to countermand his leader's beliefs, Chujuro opted to remain silent. May was right anyways, not even ten minutes later the man she had spoken of could be seen walking towards them. May San, the man greeted with a smile, I hope you had a pleasant night. It was nice, May replied, Kanoha is a rather peaceful village, she paused and raised an eyebrow, I hope you are all ready to go, Arashazan. Of course, Arisha replied with a chuckle, I finished my business a few days ago, I was more or less just lazing around before I started on my travels again. Then we should head out, May said, and together, the three of them walked out of the north gate. It wasn't long after that they had taken to the trees, traveling along the shortest route to reach the small port town that May and Chujuro had arrived from. The time spent traveling was quiet, Erishur used it to speak with his inner demon. Akanakan, have you ever been to Mizu no Kuni? Once or twice, Bijou rarely ever traveled away from the nations they were given to watch over. Akane paused, however, I did travel a bit when I began hearing of the other bijou getting captured and sealed. I visited Mizu no Kuni during my travels then. While Erishur was talking to his inner vixen, Mei and Chujuro were keeping an eye on the young man. Mei in particular was curious about him, while Chujuro was interested in seeing the Uzumaki bloodline up close. The group of three traveled for five hours, stopping when the sun began to set. Okay, now that we're far out of Kanoha, May turned her eyes on Erisher, why don't you tell me how you really found out about my request, the way she said those words let the redhead know that she was not asking him. I should have figured my excuse would seem flimsy, Erisher chuckled a bit as he rubbed the back of his head. Unfortunately, I can't tell you precisely how I heard about your visit to the Sandame, at May's scowl he added, but I can tell you that not much goes through that village without me hearing about it. May raised an eyebrow, from the way he spoke it sounded like he had a spy network in Kanoha, or something that ran along those lines. She wondered for a moment how it was that he could have a network that was extensive enough to slip into the Hokage's room unnoticed. Meanwhile Chujuro looked at Erishur in suspicion, Tatarumi-sama, how do we know we can trust him? You can't, Erishur. Said, answering the blue-haired swordsman's question for May. All you can do is either accept my words as the truth when I say I want to help you, or you don't, it's as simple as that. 
However, you too are ninja, trust isn't really something you dole out without good reason. So I wouldn't expect you to trust me until I can prove myself to you. I'll trust you, for now, May said, however, if you give me any reason to suspect treachery, you will be dealt with. Understood, she asked, in a sickeningly sweet voice that sent shivers down Naruto's spine. You know, I actually kind of like her. You would, Naruto resisted a scowl as he turned a smile on Mei, I understand perfectly. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf The trip through Hai no Kuni took one week total, it would have taken less time but they had run afoul of a group of bandits that had been stupid enough to make comments about how they were going to ride the pretty little red head until she was all used up resulting in Naruto laying witness to the most brutal slaughters he had ever seen. Chujuro, while lacking in any kind of confidence seemed to grow a pair when he heard Mei insulted, and had used his sword, Hiramakariai. It had been interesting to see the sword in action, the Hiramakariai had two holes in the upper end of the blade that were capable of shooting out chakra, which Chujuro seemed capable of manipulating to form weapons, such as a hammer. The only problem he had was that the weapon seemed to tire him out easily. However, while Chujuro's weapon and skills were impressive, what had really held Naruto's interest was Mei's ability. She was very observant while in battle and could pick up on slight discrepancies in other person's personality, had a very strong taijutsu style, which Naruto had lain witness to when she kicked a man straight through a tree. She wasn't like Tsunade, a student of the Sandame Hokage who was said to be capable of crushing boulders with a finger flick, but she was definitely powerful. But it was her nature manipulation that had really piqued Naruto's interest. Mei was capable of using the earth, fire, and water natures, and had two kekiai genkei, a bloodline trait similar to the Uzumakis, only hers was elemental based. The first, by fusing earth and fire elements, allowed her to use yotan, lava release, ninjutsu, which made her capable of feats such as spitting out lava that could melt almost anything in its path. The great amount of steam generated after the lava strikes also managed to serve as an effective smokescreen, allowing her to attack again while the enemy was distracted. During the battle she had used this ability to great effect, Naruto had almost felt pity for the man whose balls she had melted off. The second, by fusing water and fire elements, allowed her to use Futon, Boil Release, Ninjutsu, which granted her the ability to release a corrosive mist that was capable of burning away anything it touches. After the battle, she had told him that she had the ability to alter the potency and acidity of the mist created by her Futon techniques and she was apparently not affected by the mist herself. They made it to a small port town and had booked passage that would take them to Mizu no Kuni, Land of Water, the nation where Kirigakure was located. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf Erisher closed his eyes and smiled as he felt the breeze blowing against his face, he took a deep breath as the smell of the ocean filled his senses. It was an invigorating experience for someone who loved to try new things. Having only started traveling last year he had never been out to sea before, it was definitely an experience worth returning to at some point in time. May had said that it would take two weeks to reach Mizu no Kuni's shores, and another week to get to the rebel encampment. Given that he was likely to be integrated into the war very soon, the redhead felt it would be wise to enjoy what peace he had left. You could enjoy some of that peace here in the seal with me, Akane suggested with a smile that went unseen, I was thinking we could make a beach and I could even do some suntanning, topless. Erisher felt his face heat up at her comment as the image of a topless Akane came to his mind. Can you please, please not say things like that when I'm in public? What's wrong Narutakun? I thought you would like the images that provoked. I do, no wait, I don't, no wait, it just that, he was cut off by Akane's giggle, oh my, you're so fun Naruto-kun. Erisher scowled as the woman's laughter faded, he was so glad this body was only real in its looks. If his transformation had made his body the same as any other 18-year-old, then he would have needed a cold shower right about now. A very cold shower. Enjoying the weather, Turning his head Erisher saw Mei walking up behind him with the same cheerful smile on her face that she always had. He quickly shoved Akane's words into the back of his mind, lest he begin stripping the auburn-haired beauty in front of him with his eyes. 
More like the experience, Erisher said as he turned back to look out at the ocean. I've never traveled by sea before, it's surprisingly soothing. The weather is nice too though, he added at the end. May smiled as she changed the subject, it will only be a few more days before we reach the port of Fawado Keiko, floating harbor, then we'll be in Mizu no Kuni. Mizu no Kuni was one of the five great shinobi nations and contained the hidden village of Kirigakure. It was composed of many islands, with each having its own unique traditions. During their travel towards the port in Kanoha, Erisher had May tell him what she knew of Mizu no Kuni's geology. What kind of situation can we expect to find once we get there? asked Erisher. I don't know, May sighed, I left my people in capable hands but during a war, even the smallest amount of time can change the tides, causing the balance of power to shift from one side to the other. For all I know the war could already be over and we could be walking to either our deaths, or our victory. That sounds a little extreme, Erisher said with a small frown. Maybe, but that's what things are like in a war. May looked at him for a few seconds longer before saying, anyways, make sure you're ready to leave by the time we reach port. As soon as we're on dry land, we'll be in enemy territory. Erisher watched her walk away. Turning back to look out at the sea he muttered, Lady, I'm always ready. Story of the ten-tailed wolf The port town the three of them got off at had definitely seen better days, the ships that would normally be bustling in and out of the port were almost non-existent, with there only being one or two ships in the dock. Most of the buildings were run down and had rust staining many different areas, making it obvious they either did not have the resources or the people to maintain appearances. As they walked further into the port city, Erisher could see a lot of people that appeared to be homeless. Many of them were sitting off to the sides of the street, begging for money or food while others were hidden in back alleys and side streets. What was worse was that Erisher could see whole families who were homeless, little children who were even more malnourished than he had been when trying to scrounge a living in the streets of Kanoha. The place was definitely bleak, if this was how things were looking under the current Mizukage's rule then he could see why people like May were fighting. They slowly worked their way through the city, being careful not to attract attention. Erisher saw several ninja wearing Kirigakure forehead protectors jumping from the roofs. The place was teeming with ninja that were loyal to the Mizukage, now he understood what May meant when she said enemy territory. No matter where he looked there was an enemy somewhere in his sight. When they reached the edge of the city Erisher spotted a middle-aged man wearing an eye patch over his right eye. He was wearing a talisman in each ear with the kanji for a humble form of, to hear, show, you ketamoa, are you, written on them twice on each side. He also had on a striped shirt and pants with seemingly the same pattern, with a green robe over them. His blue hair was pointed up in a single spike that looked slightly slanted. Over all that he wore a bluish-green kimono and a striped undershirt. A.O., May said with a smile, it is good to see you are well, but why are you the one picking us up? I thought Kira was going to be coming. I felt it would be best if I came personally, the man known as A.O. replied. I see, though her smile remained in place Erisher could sense attention to the woman that had not been there before. It was enough to put him on guard, well I'm glad to see you're taking things so seriously, I feel much safer in your hands. May and Chujuro shared a meaningful look, one that Erisher caught easily. Things remained tense as they moved out of the city and into the surrounding swampy woodlands. However, before they moved too far May and Chujuro attacked Ao, who managed to jump out of the way just in time to keep himself from getting killed. Who are you? shouted Mei as she glared at the man who Naruto figured was an imposter. Ao would have never abandoned his post when I gave explicit instructions to hold the fort. Tell me who you are. Who I am doesn't matter, the man said, his voice sounding different, gruffer, than before. Because you're going to die, a dozen Kiri ninja appeared from the surrounding trees. Mei Terumi, we've been waiting a long time to kill you, with you gone the bloodline rebels won't have anyone to look up to. How did they find out about us? asked Mei, wondering how they knew she had left Kiri and when they would get there. Mei-san, can you do a swishoha, water shockwave? asked Erisher. 
Of course, said May, she would have scoffed at the question were the situation not so seriously. Then do so. May blinked at the commanding note in the red-haired man's voice, had this been a normal situation she would have questioned why he was ordering her around. As it was she found herself performing the hand seals at near blinding speed. One of May's greatest strengths had always been her hand seal speed, which was faster than most ninja could ever hope to keep up with in their life. Sway Tun, Swishoha, Water Release, Water Shockwave, because Mizu no Kuni was nothing more than a string of islands, water was an extremely abundant resource. The area that Naruto, Mei and Chujuro were standing had several rivers and streams that connected to the sea. So when Mei called out her jutsu, water from every direction surged towards them, creating a large vortex. Before anything else could happen Naruto slammed his hands on the ground. Large cracks appeared around him and the rebel leader and her bodyguard, right before several gouts of flame burst up from the cracks. The fire hit the vortex of water, creating a thick mist that was impossible for anyone to see through. What the hell? Damn it, I can't see. Who cares? Just launch your jutsu at their last location, voice shouted from all around them, and Mei was trying to figure out what Erisher was doing, and what she herself should be doing. The situation was soon taken out of her hands as she felt herself being scooped up into a pair of arms almost faster than she could react, her instincts almost led her to lash out at whoever had grabbed her. She flicked one of the kunai that she kept secured in her sleeves and was about to stab the person carrying her, when she looked and noticed it was Erisher. What are you doing? she asked, both curious and slightly peeved about him carrying her. The boss is taking care of the bad guys at the moment he didn't want you and Chujuro to get in the way. The boss? Yeah, I'm just a clone. Oh. Four. Some reason the knowledge that she was being carried by a clone surprised her. The clone stopped at a tree branch a little ways away and set her down. Where's Chujuro? asked Mei, worried about her bodyguard and friend. Over there, Arashi's clone pointed to a tree two feet away where Chujuro was standing next to another clone. Just then screams came in through the mist, and Mei couldn't help but wonder what was going on within the thick, white smoke screen. Story of the ten-tailed wolf moving as far away as he could be while still remaining in the mist, Erisher waited until the third Kage Bunshin he had made dispelled, letting him know both Mei and Chujuro were out of the mist. That meant he could get to work. Calling forth Haikage no Kamki, Erisher closed his eyes and began to sense out his opponents. He felt a light breeze coming from the left of him and acted quickly, running towards the source of the breeze and slicing his sword in a vertical slash. He easily felt as well as heard his blade slicing through flesh and bone, which was soon followed by a scream that turned into a strangled gurgle, then a thud as the man fell to the floor. Dead. Did you hear that? It came from over there. Erisher followed the voices with his ears to pinpoint their exact location, when he found the two that spoke he made liberal use of the sunshin to move behind one of them. A flash of his blade and the shinobi the red-haired swordsman was standing behind was killed, literally chopped in half at the waist as the top half of his body went flying. A loud thud and a shriek let him know the several body had hit another ninja, a kunoichi by the sound feminine tone. Or maybe a man who screamed like a girl. Either way he assumed it was a woman, that complicated things a little. He appeared right in front of the ninja who screamed, definitely a girl now that he saw her and reversed the grip of his blade, smacking the kunoichi in the temple and knocking her unconscious. It may seem sexist, but ever since he began raiding bandit camps and saving the occasional woman from rape and worse, he had promised himself that he would never kill a woman unless it was a clear-cut case of kill or be killed. And he didn't feel it had gotten to that point yet. Out of instincts alone, Erisher ducked and rolled forward, his enhanced senses picked up the swish of a blade where he had previously been. Sucking in a deep breath, he blew out a compressed ball of wind and was rewarded with a shout of pain. Whoever had been hit would be dead so, no matter where they got hit. He had gotten his futon, Rankutin, wind release, drilling air bullet, to the point where he could compress to the size of a baseball. While it was much smaller, 
and didn't have have as much mass, it was also much more powerful, and would blow a hole through anything it hit. Sending a pulse of chakra to act as a sonar, Erisher could tell there were eight more ninja around him, and they were currently trying to get out of the mist. He quickly set himself into a stronger stance, feet spread at a 45-degree angle from each other, shoulder distance apart with his knees bent. His sword was in a two-handed grip and held near his face with the blade pointing up. Sending out another pulse he memorized the location of each enemy ninja. Uzumaki Hijitsu, Yamaton, Kage Shinten, Uzumaki Secret Technique, Dark Release, Shadow Extension, the words were barely whispered as Erisher spun around in a circle. Were the mist not still acting as an effective smokescreen, the enemy ninja would have seen Arashi's blade become covered in shadows that shot out in a long 25-foot extension. As it was they did not see and therefore could do nothing as it cut into them. Hearing eight separate thuds, Erisher knew he had one. He released a burst of wind chakra that dispersed the misty smoke screen. Story of the ten-tailed wolf may watched as the mist dispelled and was shocked to see Erisher, whole and single without a scratch on him and all of the ninja sent after them on the ground, mostly dead. Was that Muon Satsujin Jutsu, silent killing technique? asked Mei as the red-haired swordsman jumped to her position. The what? asked Erisher confusedly, he had never heard of that particular style. It's a style used for silent assassinations, Mei explained, one of the former members of the Kiri Shinobigatana Nananin Shu, Zabuza Momoichi was a master of this style. While I know of Zabuza I've never heard of silent killing, Erisher shrugged, anyways, we need to leave. Those ninja I just beat were far too weak to be an ambush squad, they couldn't have been higher than Chunin. They were likely only here to slow us down. So then we'd better get out of here fast, Mei muttered. Chujuro. We're moving out, she shouted down to Chujuro was still on the ground. The blue-haired shinobi looked up and nodded. Let's go, the three of them took. Chujuro jumping into the trees to follow them as they sped towards the rebel hideout. Hopefully they would reach the base before the real ambush group arrived. Story of the ten-tailed wolf back within the village of Kanoha things had gotten rather, tense. A series of large pranks had been played on many of the shops, restaurants, and even the clans in Kanoha for the past three weeks. The first string of pranks had been done the first morning of the first day of the week, when the store owners of several prominent shops, all of which had refused Naruto entrance, found all of their stock and inventory switched out with stuff from other stores. Even the items and supplies that had been locked up were swapped. Grocery stores found their food had been switched out with leather, silk, cotton and other cloth needed to make clothes, while civilian outfitting stores had their entire stock of clothing supplies replaced with fruits, vegetables, meats and canned goods. It took several hours for the stores to get everything sorted out. And when they did sort it out and go home, the next day they found their supplies had all been swapped again, forcing them to work extra hard once more. This continued on for a full week, and by the time the person who plotted this prank was done, the store owners and clerks were all so exhausted from working, and trying to sort everything out that they had closed shop the next day. The second week consisted of two pranks. The first was sneaking into the Inazuka clan compound and stealing several dozen bottles worth of dog piss and pheromones. All of the dog piss was dumped into the various food stuff of several different restaurants that had refused Naruto service, while the pheromones were set up in a spray bottle with a timed release on the ceiling fans, this way every hour on the hour the spray would launch a concentrated dose of pheromones that would spread out across the room where people were eating. Many people had become sick after eating the food full of dog piss, but as soon as they tried to leave so they could go home they were beset by dozens of horny stray dogs that proceeded to dry hump them. It became even worse when whoever had set up this prank had released the kennel for the Inazuka dogs, so on top of the hundred of strays that had started molesting the civilian and shinobi population, they also had to deal with several dozen large, horny mean dogs. Many people became mentally scarred that day. The second prank of that week had been on the Umbu headquarters. The entire building, which had previously been a nondescript grey colour, was now a bright puke green. The inside of the building, 
which should be impossible for ordinary citizens to sneak into, had been entirely covered floor to ceiling in bubble wrap. The masks, which normally had a painted depiction of some kind of animal had all been cleaned to their original white. Then someone had taken the liberty of paying crude-looking penis right next to where the mouths were. Some even had two penis. On the third week the prank seemed to have been taken a step up, and the prankster had decided to begin hitting Kanoha's clans. The first to receive a prank were the Nara and Yamanaka clans. The deers that the Nara clan looked after had all had their hair shaved into varying shapes, the leaf symbol, the Uzumaki swirl, a Hiroshin kunai, a very detailed depiction of Kurina Yuhi, Yuga Yuzuki, Hana Inazuka and Anko Mitarashi naked and fondling themselves. This not only caused a problem with all of the Nara clan wives, but also the four aforementioned women who, upon hearing of this, had stormed the Nara head house and demanded an explanation on the threat of castration. Poor Shikaku never knew what hit him. The next prank was played against the Hyuga clan, aka the White Eyes, aka the Weird Blind Guys, aka the clan of closet perverts. This particular prank had involved every single Ika Ika book ever made being placed in the dresser drawer of every male. Hyuga. Needless to say, when the female members found the legendary perverted books in their husbands, boyfriends, brothers' drawers, getting jukin to death was the least of the worries. The only female who did not jukin any male Hyuga member's balls off, was one Hinata Hyuga, who had been given her own copy of Ika Ika. The minute she had looked at the pages upon pages of graphic porn, the poor girl had been blown back into a wall. Receiving both a concussion and passing out from severe blood loss. The final prank was not against a clan per se but it was just as, if not more vicious than the other ones combined. One day as Sasuke Uchiha was getting back from training, he had been busy entertaining thoughts on killing Itachi. It was because he was so preoccupied that he never noticed the small dart flying towards him until it became lodged in his neck. He had woken up, five hours later, stripped to his boxers, which were pink and said, I love men on, them, tied up and hanging from the ceiling of Kanoha's only gay bar, which was where the next Sasuke Uchiha fan boy club meeting was to take place not five minutes later. The village of Kanoha soon played host to loud, terrified shrieks, making many assume ghosts were haunting the place. By the end of the third week, tension was running high and everyone, civilian and shinobi alike were looking over their shoulder, wondering when they would be pranked next. In order to maintain the illusion that everything was under control, the Hokage had called all of the jonin and umbu that were in the village for an emergency meeting. I am sure you all know why you are here, Hiruzen Saratobi began, smoking on a multicolored pipe that looked like a child had gotten a hold of some pain and splattered it on. It was only a minor prank that had gotten him but it was still annoying to know that someone could reach his pipe and do that. What if it had been poisoned? Because of the string of really funny-ass pranks, right? asked Anko, a woman with light brown, pupilless eyes. Her violet hair was done up in a short, somewhat spiky ponytail. As was her usual coat of dress she was wearing a tan overcoat, complete with a fitted mesh body suit that stretched from her neck down to her thighs. She wore a dark orange miniskirt, as well as a forehead protector, a small pendant that looks like a snake fong on a thick cord rather than a chain to prevent it from being easily torn off in combat, a wrist watch, and shin guards. She also had on a dark blue belt around her waist that connected to her skirt that had an appendage-like sash. Hidden on the back of her neck on the left side was a seal, which had the appearance of three tomo. Currently, she was grinning like it was her birthday. I don't know about you, but some of those pranks had me laughing my ass off. You mean like the one where the Nara clan deer had a depiction of you naked on it, asked a random jonin who was instantly regretted talking as several. Snakes wrapped around him and slammed him straight into a wall. Was that really necessary and Kosen? asked Saratobi. The woman just gave him a dead pan look, reminding him of just who he was talking to. Right, Saratobi sighed, he almost forgot who he was dealing with. As you know these past three weeks we have played host to a string of pranks. However, these pranks aren't just the harmless pranks of a child, somehow, 
whoever did these has managed to prank the Umbu along with some of our most powerful Kekiai Genke clans. If someone can sneak into the compounds of our most prominent clans and Umbu HQ for a simply prank, then they could just as easily do the same thing for more devious purposes. Like say, putting poison in the Huga's water supply that silenced everyone as they realized the seriousness of the situation. So what do we do, asked a random Jonin in the back. Obviously our patrols and guard points have been compromised, therefore we need to come up with entirely new patrol routes, as well as random inspections and guard shifts. The Hokage spent the rest of the time detailing their new plan to guard against these pranks and the more serious threat of someone who may use the knowledge for more nefarious purposes. They never noticed a small fly that had been sticking to the wall disappear in a puff of smoke. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf A soft whistling sound could be heard by Erisher as he, Mei and Chujuro made their way to the Bloodline Rebel Faction's hideout. Scatter, he shouted causing the other two to break away just as several kanai with exploding tags hit the place they had previously been moving to, then exploding and taking out the tree they had stuck to in a blaze of fire. Erisher swore as he looked behind them to see nearly three dozen shinobi, he could tell these ones were the elite, jonin, from the way they moved and their flak jackets, which the first dozen he beat didn't have. I hope one of you two have a plan, he commented right before he sucked in a deep breath, and then blew out a large fire dragon that roared fiercely as it charged toward several of the Kiri ninja. Suetun, Suijinhiki, water release, water wall, one of the Kiri shinobi called out, summoning forth a large wall of water that swirled around them as the fire dragon struck. There was a loud explosion of steam as the two jutsu cancelled each other out. Mei watched with a small amount of shock as Erisher used a rather powerful jutsu without a single hand seal, that kind of ability took decades of dedicated training. She herself could only do the Mizu Bunshin, water clone, without hand seals. Just who was Erisher Kazama? Two of us are going to have to stay behind in order to keep the enemy from following, Mei said as she came up with a plan of action. The one who goes on ahead will go to our main base as fast as they can and get reinforcements to help the other two out. Well, considering I have no clue where the base is. I'm staying, Erisher commented. He was fine with staying here, this would be his first true test as a shinobi anyways, fighting bandits and the occasional small-time ninja wasn't really much of a test anyways. How far is the base? Not far, Chujuro answered for Mei, about a mile out from here. So who am I going to get the honor of fighting alongside today? Chujuro opened his mouth to volunteer but Mei beat him to it, I will. But Titarumi sama stuttered our Chujuro. Don't worry about me Chujuro, Mei said with a calm smile, despite the fact they were still being chased. I am a Kage level ninja after all, I'll be fine. When it looked like the blue-haired swordsman was about to argue she said, this isn't the time, the faster you get to base, the sooner you can get help. Now go. Chujuro knew when he wouldn't win a battle and quickly took off, leaving the two others behind. So, how do you want to do this? asked Erisher, gripping his sword as he looked over his shoulder at the horde of ninja coming towards them. May smiled as she sped through a number of hand seals, we'll do it like this, you may want to get behind me. Futon, Komu no Jutsu, Boil Release, Skilled Mist Technique, blowing out a deep breath, May created a cloud of mist which she from her mouth. Erisher, who had scrambled behind her before she blew out the mist, watched as the first wave of ninja were unable to slow down and ran straight into the mist. The affects were almost immediate as screams of pain sounded across the woods, the men who had ran afoul of the mist were being melted. Of course, only about five of the nearly five dozen ninja ran into the mist. The rest were able to circumvent the ever-expanding cloud. Erisher dispelled his sword and went through a series of hand seals for one of his more powerful jutsu. Futon, Uzumaki Koku no Jutsu, Wind Release, Cutting Winds of the Whirlpool, the jutsu was his only original technique, it had taken him five months to come up with the idea for the jutsu, another two to figure out the hand seals, and three months of having 200 Kage Bunshin, all enhanced with Akane's Yuki, practicing it to complete. The jutsu itself, 
was not that complicated in what it did, but the amount of control one had to have over their wind chakra was astronomical. It had taken coming up with several of his own advanced exercises to train his wind nature beyond that of what was normally considered mastery. That had also extended the amount of time it took to master the jutsu, making it take a year and three months with 200 kage bunshin each day to truly complete. Sucking in a deep breath, Erisher blew out a large stream of wind that soon became a spinning vortex of power cutting winds. The air rippled as the wind tore through the ground and trees, the shimmering form of the jutsu was shown as a giant whirlpool, nearly 65 feet in diameter. The ninja who had been in front of them didn't stand a chance. The winds tore through them like paper, shredding their bodies to the point where they didn't even look human, just lumps of bleeding flesh that was blown away by the fierce winds that the technique caused. Even the near dozen ninja that had not been caught in the epicenter of the blast were not left unharmed, those who were too close were sucked right into the jutsu, suffering the same fate as those who had been struck by the full force of the attack. While those who were too far away for the jutsu to suck up, were blown away and sent flying in a dozen different directions. By the time the jutsu had died down, twenty-two of the ninja that had been after them were dead, while another dozen had been blown away and the last dozen escaped and scathed. Such incredible power! May thought in shock, he channeled insane amounts of wind chakra into his lungs, then manipulated it into a condensed whirlpool like spiral and added wind blades into the mix, combining the two main uses of wind chakra into one fierce jutsu. Not only that, but he managed to add a rotating effect to the whirlpool, which sucked all those within a several foot radius into its power, and expelling those who were too far away. That kind of nature manipulation is off the charts. I don't even know if I would be capable of doing something like that. Shocking May out of her thoughts, Erisher began to cough violently and fell to a knee. He placed one hand on the ground while his other went to his mouth as he began coughing up blood. D damn it, it's still not truly complete, a canican, damage assessment. You managed to cut up the inside of your lungs and throat, Akane said as she began channeling her yuki into his damaged organs to regenerate them. Thankfully, you didn't tear your lungs apart like you did the last time you tried this. I don't think you'll be able to fully master this jutsu until you become a hanyu. You simply don't have enough chakra to use the jutsu and liberally coat your lungs and throat for protection at the same time. Right, note to self, wait until hanyu to use jutsu again. Are you alright, Arashizen? asked Mei as she leaned over him. Yeah, that jutsu still isn't complete, so it takes a toll on my body to use, he said. Looking towards the area of destruction his jutsu caused he added, I apologize, but until my lungs heal I won't be much help for the rest of this fight. Mei looked over to see what he meant and realized that there were still many ninja who had not gotten killed or injured during the attack. That's fine, she said with a smile, you just sit back and let me show you why I'm the leader of the bloodline faction. And with that she began running the gauntlet on hand seals, her movements so fast even Erisher could barely see them. Yotan, Jinsaku Yutama, Lava Release, Rapid Fire Lava Bullets. May began spitting out several red globs of lava at a rapid pace, and Erisher got to see just how accurate she as every shot fired hit someone. Sometimes she would get a head shot, resulting in the instant death of whoever was unfortunate enough to be hit, and others would hit limbs, torso, hands, no matter where she hit though, the jutsu always melted straight through, even the flak jackets that would often give some minor protection against kanai would simply become molten ash. By the time the kiri forces had gotten close enough to truly attack in force, they had already been cut down to twenty ninja. It was here that Erisher saw how power May's taijutsu truly was. The woman's style seemed to be more centered on using her feet than her fists, lashing out with powerful kicks that would literally break bones with each hit, oftentimes the person that would get caught by one of her attacks would be sent flying into and sometimes through a tree. Several of the ninja tried to catch her off guard by combining their chakra for a powerful sui tanjutsu, but thanks to Mei's dual sub-elemental kekiai genke their attacks might as well have been buildings blocks thrown by a toddler having a temper tantrum. When the Kiri forces launched a combined water dragon at her, 
May created a power wall of lava that rendered the attack ineffectual and consequently saved her from several kanai that had been thrown in the hope she would be caught off guard. May had then caught the entirety of the enemy ninja off guard by melting the wall back into lava and using it to create a powerful wave that swept the majority of the enemy forces away, right until they all melted down to their base components. There. May said as she clapped her hands together in a manner that said she was finished. She turned to Erisher and smiled, how was that? Not bad, Erisher said as he stood up, his lungs were healing along nicely and he could finally breath properly now. Using his quick reflexes he flick her a kanai that sailed right towards May and passed by her cheek, a thud was heard and May turned around to see an enemy shinobi with the same kanai Erisher had just thrown lodged between his eyes. She turned back to her red-haired companion and saw a smirk on his face, but you missed one. May couldn't help it as she burst out laughing, the absurdity and slight anticlimactic ending from that line was just too amusing to her. Letting out a little chuckle himself, Erisher was going to speak up when a voice came from several meters away, May Sama, they both turned and saw Ao, the real Ao, along with Chujuro and nearly three dozen rebel ninja. May tapped her foot on the ground and crossed her arms under her chest, unconsciously bringing attention to her bust. You're late, she said, tapping her foot on the ground and raising an eyebrow at the man, as you can see, Harashazan and I have already taken care of our ambushers. A.O. turned to look at Erisher, who noticed his gaze and raised an eyebrow, can I help you? So you Erisher, the man said, nodding in approval as he looked the red head over. We need all the help we can get. And it's nice to see that Turumi-sama managed to get the help of a real man. Need, a real, man, May's eyebrows began to twitch as she heard his words, but thanks to some odd form of selective hearing, only managed to hear the words that pissed her off more than anything else. It's nice to see you strong enough to stand on your own two feet when engaged in combat. Need, a real, man, engaged. By this point May's eyebrows began to twitch prominently and she looked supremely annoyed. Why, back in my day. By that point Erisher had stopped listening as he felt an intense killing intent coming from May. He turned to see her giving Ao a sickly sweet smile that absolutely scared the crap out of him. Ao, May said in a pleasant voice, shut up, or I'll kill you. Ao blinked and took a step back from the auburn-haired beauty in no small amount of fear, what did I do? Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf Profile on the Uzumaki Clan Originally, the Uzumaki Clan had actually been a clan of samurai, well known for their powerful and talented swordsmanship. No one knows when the Uzumaki Clan gained the Kekiai Genkei that would earn them the reputation as one of the most powerful clans in existence. All that is known is sometime during the era when the man known as the Rikudu Senin discovered Chakra, the Uzumaki clan were one of the first to appear with a bloodline. The bloodline is called Haidokage no Yaiba, and is a chakra-based bloodline. However, unlike most chakra-based Kekiai Genkei, which are usually elemental in nature, such as the Shodame's Mulkutan ability, the Uzumaki bloodline is Kenjutsu-based. Formed from the chakra of an Uzumaki when their soul could be considered an adult, no two Uzumakis will ever have the same blade. Each sword is distinctly unique, both in its looks and abilities. Records on the different abilities of an Uzumaki sword are scarce however, some people have claimed to have lain witness to Uzumaki's launching power cyclones out of their swords, or swords that can produce powerful toxins, some have even claimed to have seen Uzumaki blades that were capable of controlling the very elements as if it were child play. Because of these powers, the Uzumaki clan's bloodline is one of the most coveted in the world. Many have tried to gain an Uzumaki sword, only to fail due to how zealously the secrets of their bloodline was guarded. During the Third Great Shinobi War, the Uzumaki clan, which had founded the village of Yuzushiogakure no Kuni, a powerful shinobi village even though it was not considered one of the five great nations, had allied itself with Konoha, the Uzumaki clan had a long-standing friendship with the Senju clan. Because of the threat they represented, Kiri, IWA and Kumo launched a simultaneous attack on Yuzushiogakure. Outnumbered 10 to 1 the Uzumaki clan didn't stand a chance, the siege lasted for several months, Kanoha had tried to send aid but were blocked off by Kiri's large armada of 
ships. In the end, the Uzumaki clan had been destroyed, and the few surviving members scattered. Aside from their powerful kenjutsu and bloodline, the Uzumakis were well known for the resilience their bodies possessed. Many of the surviving members of the force that had attacked Yuzushio would claim that it was like fighting the dead, as no matter how badly damaged an Uzumaki was, they would get right back up and keep fighting. Ah, there are Arashizen, Erisher turned from the bar he was sitting on to see Mei smiling at him, I've been looking for you. We're having a meeting in five minutes and I would like for you to attend. And you came to personally get me, asked Erisher with a smile, I feel pretty special. As you should, Mei said with just a hint of a smile, now come on. All right then, Erisher drained the liquor that was left in his shot glass, being unable to get drunk thanks to Akane had some benefits, set it back on the table as he stood up and stretched. He followed Mei as she led him down one of the corridors inside the Bloodline faction's main base. Has something happened? he asked at last, wondering if he might finally take part in an operation. It had been two months since he had been here and not once had he actually been called on to do anything. Part of the reason he knew was that the war was currently at a sort of stalemate, the Mizukage's forces were too big, their bases too well defended for the Bloodline faction to attack, at the same time the rebels were too well hidden and usually worked in small cells, making it harder for the Mizukage's forces to pinpoint their locations and attack them. Another reason he had not been on any missions was because he was sure that many of the rebels didn't quite trust him yet. There wasn't much in the way of open hostility, but he could see that several people did not truly trust him. Maybe, May replied as they entered the war room, where all of the plans were made. The room was fairly small, unlike the audience chamber where May would address her troops, this room was only large enough to hold about twenty people before it became overcrowded. There was a large, square table with a map of Mizu no Kuni on it, and Erisher saw several of what looked like shugi pieces representing the Kiri, red, and bloodline forces, blue. What is he doing here? asked one of the people already in the room with a sneer. Shuhei Hisagai was a tall and lean-built man with dark grey eyes, short black hair and three scars straight over his eye that lead down to his right cheek. He also had the number, 69, tattooed on his left cheek as well as a blue striped tattoo running across his left cheek and over the bridge of his nose. He wore a choker around his throat and matching armbands on both upper arms. His clothing consisted of the standard garb of a Kiri shinobi, camouflage pants, blue shinobi sandals, and a grey flak jacket. The only difference between his clothes and most jonin was that his shirt was sleeveless. He is here because I believe he will be useful for this operation, May said in a voice that could cut through steel. Hisagi shut his mouth, knowing better than to question his leader's decision. There was a reason she was in charge of the Bloodline faction, after all. She and Erisher made their way over to the table, the red-haired swordsman choosing to stand next to Ao. Now if there are no more people who feel the need to speak out of turn, perhaps we can get started when no one else around the table spoke she continued. We've received an important message from our spies in the capital. It seems the daimyo has finally managed to discover Yugura's involvement in the bandit attacks on several of the less populated settlements and decided to let slip to us some vital information. Bandits were always a problem during a war, especially a ninja war. Many ninja missions centered around clearing out the threat of bandits when they became too much of a problem, but with the two Kiri factions busy fighting each other the bandits who had come to Kiri essentially had free run to rape, pillage and plunder to their heart's desire. What made this particular problem worse was that Yagura, the Yande Mizukich, was actually sanctioning these bandit raids. It was a reprehensible act but the fact of the matter was, war cost money. You had to buy food, weapons and supplies, and you had to pay your soldiers. The problem with all of that was that none of that was cheap, and with the shinobi busy fighting a war, there were less forces available for missions. Because of that, preying on innocent civilians was much more lucrative, than taking out bandits. The simple fact was bandits had more money than most civilians, and could pay the shinobi to turn a blind eye to their activities, or to even help them. It was often said that crime paid better than justice. 
This is good as it means that he is now on our side, not only will this give us an advantage in the war, but, when, we win, we will have the backing and support of the daimyo for when we begin rebuilding the village. When, not if, she said that as if it was a foregone conclusion. Erisher actually found her confidence not only reassuring, but refreshing as well. May paused here to let that information sink in. The information we've been given are the departure date of the quarterly caravan as well as a list of scheduled checkpoints. For those of you who don't know, the quarterly caravan is one of the four annual caravans sent by the daimyo to fund the village. Needless to say that means a lot of money and a lot of security measures. There should be roughly 200 ninja guards total, and we suspect they will be split up into at a minimum of three groups. They will most likely use the standard escort formation, one group with the caravan, one group to take up the rear, and another the fore. There is a, also a possibility that they will have several smaller scouting parties as. Well, which means we will need to be on our guard. Our plan of action will be to ambush the caravan at one of the checkpoints, we will be comprised of three teams, a distraction team, an ambush team, and the last team will be an emergency extraction team. The basics of the plan was simple, the distraction team, which would comprise of the main attack force, would draw most of the enemy out with a frontal assault. When most of the enemy had been drawn away from the caravan the ambush team would kill whoever was left behind to guard the caravan and begin unloading the money. The last team was set in case things went south, going off the knowledge that no plan ever survived contact with the enemy and things could very easily get sticky. Erisher paid attention as May and several others began discussing the plan in greater detail, each person adding their own input. He didn't add any of his own advice, not that he had much to add as he had never been in a war before and therefore only had basic knowledge on tactics and battles. Instead, he spoke with who he had dubbed his inner vixen, what do you think of the chances for success? As good as any other plan, Akane said, shrugging as she combed her tails. Not that her container could see, the problem is there is no such thing as a surefire plan in war. Oftentimes as soon as the attack begins you can be assured that things will go to hell. Sounds like you've experienced war, he commented idly while listening to May argue with one of her senior officers on which checkpoint they should stage their ambush at. Of course I have. Remember, I am over 2000 years old. In that time I have seen and been involved in more wars than any human can possibly imagine. Arashi's ears perked up at this, how many wars have you been involved in? Several, Akane said, I was involved in several wars in the past. Arashir made to ask a question but May's words interrupted him, Arashizen, you will be working with AO's squad, and will take part on the ambush team. You can't be serious. Hisagei shouted, you want to send him on such an important assignment? How do we know he won't betray us the first chance he gets? You mean aside from the fact that I have a bloodline and would not be welcome in Yagura's forces, said Erisher, who was honestly getting pissed off at the man constantly questioning his integrity. That doesn't matter, Hisagei sneered, you're an outsider, you can't be trusted. And you're an asshole, Erisher shot back, but you don't see me complaining. Hisagei growled, what was that you little punk? Hisagei. May shouted, her voice radiating authority and displeasure, I have asked you several times to keep your opinions to yourself and not insult someone who has offered their services. The tall man looked like he was about to say something but May spoke again, if you can't get over your petty problems, then you will not take part in this mission. Understood? Yes, ma'am. Hisagei said looking like he swallowed something foul. Good, now I want all of you to prepare, the mission will commence tomorrow at dusk. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf, hey there, a gruff voice said from behind Erisher. Turning his head he saw A.O. standing behind him. What's up Ausan? asked Erisher, wondering why the man wasn't getting ready. He himself didn't have any need to get ready, all of his weapons were sealed up into containment seals he had painted on his body, so he had decided to get some fresh air and enjoy the relative peace before the big attack. I just figured I'd let you know that you shouldn't let what Hisagei said bother you, Ao looked down at Erisher with his only covered eye. Hisagei is something of an isolationist, 
he doesn't believe we need the help of outsiders and had been against the idea of getting aid from Kanoha. Erisher snorted at the man's way of understating the other ninja's issue. When May had come back nearly empty-handed Hayagi had actually had the gall to ask her if she had enjoyed her vacation as if what she had done was a waste of time and essentially saying I told you so to her face. It had caused quite a few arguments between the two and Erisher had sometimes wondered why May didn't just melt the man like she had her enemies. Don't worry, I don't take what he said personally, the redhead said after some time. The man's just an idiot, he'll eventually learn to trust me, or I'm liable to shove my foot off in his ass. Ao seemed to blink at that statement, unsure whether to accept those words at face value. So long as you don't start anything with him. You know, back in my day, story of the ten-tailed wolf, get back here you brat. Wait till I get my hands on you. Naruto looked behind him as he ran to see several jonin chasing after him, he stuck out his tongue and pulled down his eyelids, laughing, you'll never take me alive, it was a typical day for Naruto Uzumaki, who had just finished one of his many pranks. The one he had just done was tame compared to the time he got a wild hair up his ass for three weeks and managed to prank several clans as well as the Umbu. They had never caught him for those ones and no one ever realized he was the one who did them. This particular prank Naruto had made sure they knew he had done it. The young blonde had woken up early in the morning and managed to paint the entire Hokage monument, he had just finished his masterpiece when everyone had taken notice. That was when the chase began. Looking back in front of him Naruto caught sight of the Hokage monument and couldn't help but smile at his work. It was the work of a true artist. He had painted the Shodame Hokage's face into that of a wooden tiki man, with trees sprouting out of his nose, the Nidame was crying rivers of tears and had a large bruise on his cheek and a pair of pink, lace panties on his hair, the Sandame had a large blush staining his cheeks, a perverted smile on his face and blood dripping from his nose, off to the side was a billboard-sized picture of the front cover of Ika Ika Paradise, and finally his absolute masterpiece and very likely the reason the ninja chasing him were so pissed. Minato Namikaze, the Yandame Hokage and his father, had three symmetrical whisker marks running horizontally on each cheek, and on top of his head were two bright gold fox ears. It was a message that was subtle enough that no one would realize what it meant, those that did would likely assume it to be a coincidence, but it would definitely get people to look. Just you wait demon, one of the shinobi shouted as he chased after the blonde, when I get my hands on you you're dead. Then you won't be getting your hands on me. Naruto shouted with a laugh, none of you can catch me. He continued running, using side streets and back alleys as he outran and outsmarted the jonin after him. No one would even realize that they were being used by him for training. It was a method he had set up to test himself, the pranks he had played on the clans and the ANBU had tested his stealth, while the pranks that were much more showy, like painting the Hokage monument tested his ability to outrun and outsmart his opposition, like losing a tail when being chased by superior number of enemies on a mission. That, and it was just really funny to watch these fools flounder about in anger. During the chase Naruto cut through several streets where he had placed numerous traps for the jonin squads to run into. They were all so busy chasing him and their judgment had been clouded by anger that none of them even saw the traps until they had tripped some ninja wire that had been tied taut against the fence and an adjourning tree. By the time they had realized what happened five of the jonin involved in the chase were strung up by the innumerable amount of ninja wire that they suddenly found themselves caught in. What the hell? I can't get loose. Someone, cut me down from here. Naruto grinned as he heard the cries and continued running. Gotcha. Naruto turned his head back to the front to see one of the jonin lunging for him. The man was about to grab him, however he soon found himself eating a large chunk of wood. What the hell? Where'd this log come from? Naruto snickered from his hiding spot as the ninja threw the log on the ground and ran off. Never underestimate the power of one under the protection of the log, he muttered as he pulled down his camouflage. He looked around and saw none of the ninja who had been chasing him near, hee hee, what a bunch of losers, thinking they could catch me. Naruto Uzumaki cannot be caught by any mere mortal. 
Is that so, Naruto? Gah! Naruto jumped ten feet in the air as he twisted around and landed on his butt. Ow, he rubbed his now sore backside and looked up to see the familiar face of his scarred sensei. Oh, hey Iruka sensei, what are you doing here? Oh, you know, the usual. Just catching one of my students getting into trouble when he should be in class, Iruka said. He has blonde hair, blue eyes, and is wearing a hideous orange jumpsuit. You wouldn't happen to have seen him would you, maybe in the mirror, any Naruto? Nope, haven't seen him, he he he, Naruto rubbed the back of his head, well I hope your student manages to find his way to class. If I see him, I'll let him know you're looking for him. Naruto tried to leave but Iruka quickly grabbed him by the collar of his jacket, oh no you don't, you're not getting away that easily Naruto. The scarred chunin began dragging the blonde towards the Hokage monument. Ack. Iruka sensei, let go, I have to get to class. Naruto tried. Nice try, since you already missed half the lesson then it won't matter if you miss the rest to clean the monument, Iruka said, not budging an inch. And you'll have to do it all by hand. What? That's not fair sensei. Yeah, well, life's not fair. Now come on. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf, Turumi-sama, this A.O., we have a situation B, A.O. said into his field communicator as Erisher pulled his blade out of the enemy shinobi he had just pierced through the neck. I repeat, situation B, there are twelve scouting parties around the caravan, my squad just ran afoul of one. Erisher didn't question how the man knew about the scouts, he had already seen A.O.'s Byakugan and knew the man was constantly using it to look ahead for any signs of hostiles. S.H.T., roger that, they'll need to be dealt with before we can move on to the plan. Can you have your men take care of them? Over. I'll have them get right on it, over, A.O. replied. He moved his hand from his calm, peace and looked at his squad, we need to take care of the rest of the advanced scouts. We'll be splitting up into groups of two, I want you to take out the squads quietly, we can't afford to alert the enemy to our presence. The man looked over at the redhead, Erisher, you're with me. That's fine, Erisher said. Ao's squad, along with two others, split up. Erisher moved to follow the blue-haired hunter ninja, moving deftly through the trees until the man stopped and held up a hand. One of the scouting squads is 13 meters south of us, he said as his eye scanned the surroundings. Looking to where he had indicated, Erisher saw several figures moving through the trees. For Kirigakure ninja, one jonin and two chunin by the looks of them. I'll take care of this, he whispered, receiving a nod from A.O. before he sunk into the shadows. One of the many abilities he had gotten from his blade was the ability to move between the shadows, it was called Kajitoho, shadow walking, and was an ability that made the Nara's shadow manipulation abilities seem like a pale imitation of true shadow jutsu. As the squad stopped to scout the area, Erisher used the opportunity to slip into the foremost ninja's shadow. Uzumaki Hijitsu, Yamaton, Kenin Yomi, Uzumaki Secret Technique, Dark. Release, Pull of the Underworld, the whispered technique went unheard by the Kiri ninja, as it was impossible to hear someone who was inside of a shadow. However, the man did notice when the shadow grabbed him and sucked him down, the man would have shouted in surprise but a shadow had covered his mouth and he could do nothing as he was dragged into the shadow. The other three turned around and blinked and they didn't see their comrade. Just as they were about to reach for their walkies, Erisher came up from behind one of the enemy shinobi. Before he had a chance to react the man was pierced in the throat, gurgling up blood as he died. Uzumaki Hijitsu, Yamaton, Kage Shoyeba, Uzumaki Hijitsu, Dark Release many shadow blades, the other two didn't even have time to shout as two shadow-like tendrils flew out from the tip of Arashi's blade, piercing them through the head and heart respectively. Erisher pulled out his blade and swiped the blood off with a flick of his wrist. Ao whistled appreciatively as he saw how quickly and efficiently the young swordsman had dealt with the threat, you Uzumaki sure are something. Of course, why do you think we were so feared during the Third Great Shinobi War? asked Erisher, the question was rhetorical and A.O. didn't deign to give a response. 
Let's take out another squad, we need to get rid of them before the caravan moves to the next checkpoint. Right. Story of the ten-tailed wolf Erisher was crouched down on the balls of his feet, using his hands to keep his balance as he stood on the tree. Next to him was Ao and a little behind them was the man squad, they were just one of the squads that had been assigned to the ambush team, which was comprised of a total of five teams of four. The teams were a mile out from the caravan checkpoint, and were awaiting the signal to begin their mission. The last squad to get back from taking out the scouting parties had just gotten back not ten minutes ago. You know what to do when the fireworks start, asked Ao, he had already asked the question several times, likely it was an attempt to hide his nerves at working with a person he didn't know. Most shinobi squads tended to grow fairly close and having a new member usually messed with team dynamics. I'll go in and hit them hard with my kenjutsu and take out as many of the enemy as possible and get them to focus on me before the main force gets there, Erisher grunted. The Uzumaki-style kenjutsu was specifically designed to fight off multiple enemies at once by using fast, overpowering attacks to wipe out the enemy, that was why it was the Issei no Ryuken was considered one of the most powerful sword styles in the world. Ao grunted his agreement with Arashi's assessment, once the signal starts, move in fast and hit hard. You're our point man. Understood, the worst part about war, Erisher reflected as he crouched there with Ao and his ninja squad, was the waiting. Combat between shinobi had a lot of waiting involved, it wasn't like samurai battles, where two large forces met and clashed on an open plain. Shinobi warfare was about gathering information, espionage and taking the enemy by surprise, all of which required a lot of patience and waiting. The only time shinobi battled in the open was during an invasion. We are beginning our attack, wait ten minutes for the enemy numbers to thin before commencing your own run. Over, Erisher looked over at Ao, due to his sensitive hearing he was able to pick out everything May had said. Roger that, we'll commence our run in ten, over. Ao turned his head set off and looked at the squads of ninja. Turumi-sama is beginning her attack, will start in ten minutes when the shinobi guards have thinned. Erisher stood up and closed his eyes, doing his best to calm down his rapidly beating heart. This would be his first true taste of war, and he could not help but admit, even if only to himself, that he was feeling nervous. So many things could go wrong with this plan, for all they knew it already was going wrong and they were walking into a trap. There was no telling what the outcome of this battle would be, the whole plan hinged on whether or not the intel they received was accurate. Relax, Akane's soothing voice came over his mind, do not let your mind wander too much, especially to that kind of thinking. Focus only on the mission, try to block out all other thoughts and questions, lest they unravel you before the battle even starts. Right, sorry, Erisher apologized in a sheepish voice. Silly man, Akane giggled a little at her container, there is no need to apologize. I am happy to help you. Erisher relaxed as he felt some of the tension in between his shoulder blade slip, thank you. It's time, Eo stood up and everyone else followed suit, let's begin. The five teams took off, traveling at the fastest pace they could go while still remaining silent. It wasn't long before they reached the caravan. The caravan consisted of a dozen carriages with horses pulling them, and the shinobi forces had been reduced from what was likely around 100 strong, to just 30. Erisher was the first one to enter the fight, it was his job to keep the Mizukage forces focused on him so the rest could come in from behind. His sword, Haikajukami was already out and singing as he cut through the first enemy in his way. He didn't even feel any give on his blade as he severed cloth, flesh and bone as he sliced through the enemy shinobi. The man screamed out in pain and Erisher kicked him away, sending him flying into two other enemy ninja. The enemy forces soon noticed him but before they could do anything Erisher had already gone through several hand seals and spat out a dozen decent sized fireballs, most of them were dodged and exploded against the ground, leaving five foot long craters. However, the few that managed to actually hit an enemy ninja set them ablaze, lighting them up as if they had been doused in lighter fluid. Swaytun, Bakus Rishuha, Water Release, Bursting Water Collision Waves. 
Erisher turned just in time to see one of the enemy Jonin expelling a large amount of water. Before it could expand and sweep him away, Erisher had Akane channel her Yuki to his throat where he expelled searing white blaze of fire that was so hot the entire earth was glassed as it burned a path to the man using the jutsu. Normally, when a jutsu made from an opposing element is used against the element it is weak against, that jutsu would usually be destroyed, or if the jutsu was particularly strong they would both cancel each other out. However the fire that the redhead had just used was the kitsunabi, fox fire, and was the true form of the Amaterasu, the black flames of the Uchiha clan that could only be accessed by gaining the Mangekyo Sharingan. The Kitsunabi smashed into the water from the Jonin's Jutsu and completely overtook it, evaporating the water before it could actually form into an attack. It continued on and struck the Jonin, who barely even had time to scream as it burned his entire body, turning it to ash. The Jutsu continued on its way, burning everything in its path until Erisher stopped channeling Akane's Yuki. You're very lucky that that Ninjen wasn't near one of the carriages, Akane commented, not that she actually cared but seeing as how it was his mission to get what was inside of them, she didn't want him destroying them accidentally and failing his mission. Which was why I did it, Erisher replied, even as he began attacking the other shinobi who were still recovering from the shock of seeing such an intense fire jutsu. He was actually impressed that they were still responding so well, attacking even when he could see the shock clearly written on their faces. Then again, most of these ninja were experienced jonin. Had that attack struck, it would have hit the caravan behind me. I'm surprised that ninja would so carelessly use a jutsu like that, especially in a battle where he was fighting with a team that could have been hurt just as easily as me. I think you just wanted to be flashy, Akane quipped with a smirk as she saw Erisher smash the pommel of his hilt into a kunoichi's head. Shaking her own head she smiled at her container's sense of morals, they were a little odd but she wouldn't have him any other way. Well I do like showing how awesome I am, Erisher smirked, that's why all my pranks are so bad base, conversation continued along this vein as Erisher continued attacking the enemy shinobi, sometime during their chat, Ao and the rest of the squad had joined the battle and were attacking the surprised enemy from behind since all their attention had been on Erisher. It was less than 15 minutes later that the battle had ended, Ao and Erisher moved up to one of the carriages to begin unloading. They opened the door only to find it empty. What the hell, said Ao as he looked inside the carriage. How did I miss this? My Biakugan should have noticed that there was nothing inside. Erisher didn't comment, he was much more interested in the seals that were surrounding the inside of the carriage along the floor, walls and ceiling. As he studied them he saw several begin to glow and his eyes widened, move at A.O., he grabbed the man by his robe and jumped away just as the carriage exploded. It wasn't just the one they were at either, all around them the other eleven blew up, many of the ninja who were checking them did not make it and were consumed by the blast. What the hell? A.O. muttered in shock as his mind slowly realized what was going on, we've been betrayed. This whole thing was a trap. Seems like it, while his voice was calm, on the inside Erisher was swearing up a storm. It bothered him that he hadn't even suspected a trap, at least not of this caliber. However, he also knew that getting angry wouldn't help him or the bloodline rebels. If they knew about our plans in enough detail to plan this, then that means the trap is unlikely for us. Ao frowned, what do you? Turumi-sama. This trap was most likely a concerted effort to take her out, Erisher agreed, come on, have your men get moving, we need to get to Mei. What about the extraction team, asked Ao as he stood up. If this was a trap designed to take out Mei then the extraction team is as good as dead, if they're not already, Erisher replied. Had this been his plan he would have taken the extraction team out as quickly and quietly as possible, that way the main force would expect backup to come only to slowly realize they were on their own. Now let's move it before the main force is destroyed. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf As Mei watched a large number of enemy ninja stream in from all sides all she could do was swear, loudly, and vocally. The battle had started off well enough, her group had surprised the enemy forces and began battling them, drawing attention away from the caravan as they decimated the front wave of Kiri troops. 
However, after two hours into the battle nearly 300 enemy shinobi began to stream into the field, catching her own group completely unawares. Now she and the 50 survivors of her team were fighting for their lives against the 300 strong force. She knew what was happening of course, May could tell when she had been played a fool. Yagura had somehow gotten wind about her plan and laid a trap for them, and she walked right into it. Sweitun, Suigaden, Water Release, Water Fong Projectile May watched as a dozen sharp, fong-like projectiles of water came towards her and her comrades. She went through a myriad of hand seals and then slammed her hands into the ground, Dotan, Doriahiki, Earth Release, Mud Wall, a giant earth wall rose up from the ground to intercept the coming attack. The wall shook and rumbled as the water fangs tried to drill through it but were unsuccessful. By that time May had already put the jutsu out of her mind and was moving in to help her troops take care of the enemy shinobi. She entered battle with the first enemy she saw, a kunoichi that was charging at her. She dodged the first strike before lashing out with an attack of her own, kicking the other woman hard enough to send her flying into one of the kunoichi's own comrades. May shook her head at the stupidity of some ninja, you never attack a target that is superior to yourself head on. May ran up to another enemy ninja and was quick to lash out with a reverse heel that caught the man in the throat, not only was he thrown back by the kick, but May could hear the snap of a neck. She soon found herself double teamed as two jonin tried to gut her with a kunai. She swept one of the lunged hands aside and retaliated with a knife edge that caught the man in the throat. He would have staggered back but May still had a grip on his hand and she spun around and used him as a shield, letting the other shinobi stab his own partner. She then pushed the now dying shinobi into the other man who had attacked her, using him as a distraction as she pulled out a kunai and sent it into the man's head with a flick of her wrist. The man fell back without even letting out a cry. There was no time to celebrate however as the battle raged on. May ended up losing track of how long she had been fighting, weaving in and out of the range of her attackers, launching powerful strikes, most of which would kill her opponents in one hit. It was unfortunate for her that she was in an environment of mixed forces, with many of her own battling she couldn't afford to use any of her kekiai genkei jutsu, lest she hit one of her own ninja. Terumi-sama May didn't even bother turning attention away from her fight as several chakra hammers smashed into some of the enemy shinobi near her and Chujuro ran to her side with Hiramakarie swinging. Thanks to the power of the great blade and the skill the young man was able to wield it with, he managed to take out multiple enemies in a single swing. Soon enough the blue-haired young man was right next to her and they were fighting side by side, this isn't looking good, Terumi-sama. I know. May yelled out over the din of battle, it seems we've been played. As the young rebel leader was about to lose hope, help arrived in the form of Ao and Erisher, along with the other survivors of the ambush gone wrong. Ao came in hard, kunai in hand as he used his Byakugan to keep any of the enemy ninja around him from sneak attacking. Meanwhile, Erisher was a blur of motion, his sword was out and could be seen as nothing more than a flash of light. He zipped through the line of enemy shinobi, running them through like a hot knife through butter as he made his way towards Mei. Mei-san, he called whilst ducking under a kunai swipe and then lashing out with his sword, slicing the shinobi that had attacked him in half. This plan has gone down the drain. We need to retreat. I know. Mei said, jumping back as two ninja tried to double-team them right before she lashed out with twin kicks that snapped both of their necks. All forces retreat. This battle is lost. Retreat. I'll cover our retreat. Erisher said as he threw himself into the battle with fervor, determined to make sure that he saved as many of his allies as possible. At any other time May would have ordered him not to do something so foolish, but as it was there weren't that many options and so she simply continued fighting her way out of the battle with her forces. Erisher found himself weaving through a hailstorm of fists, feet, kunai and swords as he attacked the enemy forces head on. Spinning around in a 180 degree pivot, his blade began to grow a bright white as he used its ability to use light chakra. The blade sung as it sliced through steel and flesh and bones with equal impunity. 
Several more ninja attacked him and as he continued to block their attacks, Erisher ended up getting stabbed through the back. However, rather than bleed and die as was the normal for one who just got stabbed, Erisher exploded, sending all the enemy ninja who were near him sailing. Many of the Kiri forces ended up crashing into their own comrades, their bodies severely damaged with third-degree burns. The real Erisher then revealed himself by rising from the shadow of one Kunoichi, chopping her in the back of the neck and sending her to the ground. Before the enemy could detect his presence he slipped back into the shadows, thus became the game of cat in mouse as the red-haired shinobi would rise from one of his enemy's shadows and attack, only to slip back away before anyone could attack in return. It wasn't long before he stopped, realizing that if he used his ability to much someone was likely to find out about its weakness. Coming back behind another opponent he cut their head clean off, just as nearly 100 more Erisher phased into existence. The sight of so many of the same ninja appearing at once seemed to unnerve some of the enemy, since creating that many clones at once was unheard of. However, that did not stop them from attacking, hoping to take out this new threat so they could catch up to the rebel forces that by now were long gone. It wasn't until the first clone was killed that the Mizukage forces soon discovered that these were no ordinary clones. Akunoichi had managed to pierce one clone through the neck with her sword, only to discover how bad of a mistake doing that was when the clone exploded in her face, sending her, as well as several of her comrades flying. This of course, set of a chain reaction due to several other clones being in the blast radius, and soon enough the entire battlefield had descended into chaos as Yagura's forces were tossed about by the explosions with impunity. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf Do you think the kid is alright back there? asked Ao as all the forces who had managed to escape. Were running through the forest. I don't know, May worried her bottom lip in concern, I hope he makes it. The only reason they had been able to get out of that jam was because Erisher had decided to hold them off, somehow, he had managed to do so and only a few enemy ninja had escaped his near suicidal attack run, and they had been easily dealt with. You don't think Arashizen is, dead, do you? asked Chujuro, he didn't really know the young man that well, but the fact that he had helped them escape from that mess put him up a notch in his book. Kami I hope I'm not dead, that would totally suck. Several people literally jumped, even as they pulled out weapons in case the person who had just spoke was an enemy. They were all relieved and slightly annoyed when they saw the person was the man who they were talking about. Don't do that Arashizen. May said as she held a hand to her chest, feeling her heart pumping a bit both from the recent battle and the light scare Erisher had given her. Sorry, he apologized with a grin that made it hard to tell if he was serious or not. You're not sorry, May mumbled so low only Erisher was able to hear, causing his grin to widen. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf Naruto grinned as he made his way into class, the new school year was starting and though he was loath to actually attend, he knew appearances had to be kept. That was why he was made after all. Slamming the door open with his usual loud bang, he walked into the room and chose a seat next to Sasuke. The Uchiha only gave him a passing glance before he went back to brooding his only thoughts being, kill, I will kill Itachi, he will die by my hands, mmm, tomatoes. I know, weird. As Naruto was sitting there with the large, dopey grin he was so well known for by now the sound of stampeding feet soon reached the classroom. The door burst open and Ino and Sakura tried to shove each other out of the other's way. Get back in a pig. Screeched Sakura, her voice so loud that the windows rattled and Kiba and Akamaru had to hold their ears as they began to bleed. I need to get through so I can sit next to Sasukikan. Ha! As if, I'm going to be the one sitting next to Sasukikan, not you forehead. Shouted Ino as the two continued to fight over who would get to sit next to their Sasukikan. The battle took nearly ten minutes before the two just shoved each other through the door and rushed over to where Sasuke was sitting. Naruto quickly stood up and intercepted Sakura before she could sit down, Hey Sakurakan, how would you like to go on a date with, shut up Naruto and Obaka? I want to sit next to Sasukakan. Sakura shrieked in his ears as she smashed a fist into his head, sending the poor blonde to the ground. 
The pink-haired howler monkey then noticed that Ino had already claimed the spot next to Sasuke and instantly became irate. She smashed another fist on top of the recovering Naruto, this is all your fault. Now I can't sit next to. Sasukakin, with that she stalked off, finding a spot next to the ever-shy and turtle-like Hinata. Kami. I'm really beginning to hate the boss for choosing her as his crush, that damned howler monkey is a menace, Naruto thought as he rubbed the large lump on his head. He stood up and sat back down in his seat as Iruka and Mizuki came in to begin their lesson. Story of the ten-tailed wolf Naruto had a soft smile on his face as his head was resting in the lap of Akane, who had taken to gently running one of her hands through his hair. This had become a common thing for the two of them to do, during the past several years they had gotten much closer. Whenever she wasn't training him Akane would either, tease him using her body to try and get a reaction out of him, often times resulting in the young blonde gaining a major blush, due to his age he had only recently started getting nosebleeds, though even then it was only in his mind as his body still had not hit puberty. Or moments like now, where she would let Naruto rest against her. Akane had long since stopped denying to herself that she was actually in love with this boy, despite only being almost ten years old he was much more mature than most his age, usually. That maturity was actually reflected by the mental image he projected in his mindscape, which was actually fifteen, and was the only reason his mindscape image could pass out from a nosebleed. However, she knew that it was still not the right time for her to express her feelings for the boy, while he may be older in his mind than he was physically, he was still a nine, going on ten-year-old boy. Even though Akane herself didn't care about age, since if she went by age appropriateness then she would be too old for even the oldest human, Naruto still wasn't ready to enter any kind of relationship with her. Not that that didn't mean she couldn't enjoy what they did have. You seem tired, she noted softly, getting Naruto to crack one of his gorgeous blue eyes open. He smiled at her before yawning, what gave it away? Perhaps the fact that you're not your usual bundle of energy, Akane said, normally, I would be beating the shit out of you during sparring right now. Naruto stuck his tongue out at her before yawning again, he soon snuggled himself a little deeper into her lap. Akane let out a soft squeak and slight moan when her container accidentally rubbed up against her sacred spot, getting Naruto to open his eyes once again. He was slightly amused to see a blush staining the beautiful demoness cheeks, normally it he who was blushing. Although, he couldn't for the life of him figure out what she was blushing about. You okay, Akanakan? asked Naruto, your face is getting red. Too am fine, she stuttered, trying to get her mind back on track. She knew Naruto hadn't done that on purpose, but it was hard for her to just sit there and pretend nothing had happened. A part of her was telling her not to let the accident go. Unpunished and pranked the poor boy by teaching him some more about the female anatomy. Another part was screaming at her to strip the boy down and have her way with him, too young be damned. It took a concerted amount of effort, but she eventually managed to get herself under control. Of course, it was right as she managed to calm herself that Naruto said something else, N.E., Akanakan, do you smell that? The blonde took several deep sniffs of the air, it smells like, honey. Akane made several choking noises as her face took on a new hue of red. She was not embarrassed about Naruto smelling her arousal, but it was now taking a very intense effort for her to bring her pheromone levels and hormones under control. The boy was pushing all of her buttons and didn't even realize it. I'm not sure what you're talking about, Akane said, keeping her cool as she went back to playing with his hair. I don't smell anything. Must be my imagination then, Naruto frowned, he could still smell that delicious honey scent. Still, maybe he was just smelling something that was coming from outside the seal. It didn't matter anyways, so he put it into the back of his mind and decided to change topics, so how do you think I did for my first true battle? You know the one you were in when you first came here could be considered your first true taste of war, Akane said. No, Naruto frowned in thought and then shook his head, we spent most of the time running, and while I definitely fought it was more or less alone. I meant being part of a unit. Ah, the red-haired vixen nodded her head in understanding, I have to say you did very well for yourself. 
You showed talent and kept your cool even when you found out that you had all been led into a trap. And you showed great physical prowess when you covered your comrade's retreat. Akane smiled down at him and Naruto blushed at seeing the pride in her eyes, you performed well above and beyond my expectations. Hee hee, thank Akanakan, Naruto gave the vixen a grin so wide his eyes became squinted, making him look like a fox. Kawaii. Akane thought as her mind let out a very fangirl-like squeal. Just then the two of them felt a presence outside of the seal. Seems someone is trying to wake you, Akane frowned at the thought of someone taking her Naruto time. Yeah, Naruto sighed, before giving Akane another smile, I'll come back later though. Akane watched as he disappeared from her lap and sighed, she decided that since Naruto was no longer here, she might as well get some sleep. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf, Arashizen Arashizen, Arashur woke up to the sight of Chujuro standing over him. I'm up, I'm up, Arashur said as he sat up in the bed and let out a large yawn, stretching his hands over his head as high as they would go. He twisted his body so that his feet were now over the side of the bed, resting on the cold tiled floor as he looked up at his fellow swordsman. So what's up? Chirumi-sama has called a meeting and wants you to attend, Chujuro told him, getting a nod from the young man who stood up. Thanks for telling me, just let me get dressed and I'll be right out, the blue-haired man nodded and left, leaving Erisher alone. He closed his eyes for a moment and focused, causing the air to ripple around him before his standard set of clothes while in this guise appeared. He really would have to find some way to thank Akane for this ability, shape-shifting was far more useful than the henge. Not only that, but unlike the henge it would only deactivate when he let it, otherwise he stayed in whatever form he changed into indefinitely. It was damn useful for times like this. Walking outside he saw that Chujuro had waited for him, together the two of them walked down the hall and made their way to the war room. The sound of shouting reached Arashi's enhanced hearing long before they got there, and the scene they came upon was not very awe-inspiring. Currently, Hisagi looked like he had gotten into another argument with Mei, he had a good idea what they were arguing about and his thoughts were soon confirmed by the man's words. It's obvious that he's a spy. First you get attacked on the way back from Kanoha, and now we just lost one third of our troops in a trap. This is Erisher is obviously a spy working for Yugura. And pray tell, why would you think that, asked Erisher as he walked up to join Mei. Hisagi sneered at him, it's obvious that you're the one who betrayed information to Yugura, you come here and all of a sudden everything goes to shit. Wow, Erisher said in a voice that sounded mockingly impressed, you're pretty good at the whole baseless accusation thing aren't you? When a scowl crossed the other man's face the redhead continued, also, you do realize that I have a bloodline, right? Aside from the fact that Yugura would not accept help from me, what could I possibly have to gain by joining him? I don't know, Hisagi said with a glare, what do you have to gain from joining him? Erisher rolled his eyes, if you're trying to use some form of reverse psychology I think I should tell you that it's not working. He raised an eyebrow and looked at the man with a smirk, you know, you're pretty quick to jump the gun and point fingers. You aren't hiding anything are you? You're accusing me of being a traitor. Hisagi scoffed, that's rich. Erisher shrugged, you said it not me. But why don't we look at the facts, you didn't agree with May's decision to request aid from Kanoha, you have done everything possible short of outright mutiny to undermine Mason's authority, you seem to dislike me for the simple fact that I'm an outsider. Oh. And let's not forget that you're the only non-bloodline holder who was privy to the information we gained from the daimyo the redhead swordsman smirked at him, seems to me that you're more likely to betray the bloodline faction than anyone. What? Hisagi shouted angrily, he looked around to see many of the people there looking at him with something akin to suspicion. You can't all believe him can you? He's just trying to divide us so that we'll be easier to defeat. Those are some serious accusations, Arashazen, May said, eyeing him with a calculating expression. I hope you have proof of his treachery. No more proof than he did when accusing me, Erisher said, and I wasn't actually accusing anyone, merely stating facts based on my observations. Still, your, 
Observations hold some merit, May mumbled, more to herself than anyone else but everyone still heard it. You can't be serious May sama cried Hisagi, he's obviously trying to turn you against me. Then he'll ensnare you in his web and kill you when it's most convenient. Okay, first off, Erisher started angrily, he was seriously getting pissed of at this guy. If I had wanted her dead then don't you think I would have just left her during our last mission? If I was truly working with the Mizukage then that would have been the perfect time to literally destroy the Bloodline faction. What do you mean? asked Chujuro. Erisher turned to look at the shy and underconfident swordsman, think about it, without May this entire operation would fall apart. The redhead held up a hand and began ticking off his reasons, first, May is far more powerful than anyone else here, out of all of the ninja on this side she is the only one strong enough to possibly face Akage. Second, no one else has her leadership abilities, Ao might have the experience, but he simply doesn't have her charismatic presence, no one does. May actually gained a light blush at the fierce way Erisher defended her position and listed her abilities. It was almost funny because she knew he was just speaking his thoughts in as blunt a manner as possible, which in a way was what made the man's words so flattering. And lastly, May is the only one who is capable of bringing Kiri to even greater heights than it had been in the past, finished with his assessment of the woman in charge of the rebellion Erisher shrugged. Without her, this whole rebellion would fall apart, maybe not right away, but in the end it would. It's a simple scenario of, cut the head and the body will fall. Hisagi's face had been getting increasingly red with anger as Erisher spoke, he opened his mouth to speak when someone beat him to it. That's enough, May said in a firm voice that made everyone stop and turn to her. While I appreciate your assessment of me, Erisher, I believe you need to stop taunting Hisagi. Erisher looked like he wanted to say something, but in the end he simply nodded. And Hisagi, May turned to him and for once, she wasn't smiling, while I do not wish to believe you would betray your comrades we have to look at the facts at the moment. They all point towards you so far. You would believe that, that outsider over me. Hisagi asked in rage. It's not a matter of believing one person. Over another, May stated firmly, it's about looking at the evidence and making decisions based on that. What evidence? Hisagi asked, there is no evidence that I've betrayed you. There's no evidence that he has either, May pointed out, yet you still accused him. For now, I want you to stay in confinement, I will have guards posted at your door, you are only allowed to leave your room with an escort. By the time May had finished Hisagi had his fists clenched so hard they were bleeding. Fine, he ground out before stalking away, slamming the door on his way out. Ao, please make sure he stays in his room, May ordered softly. Of course my sama, Ao hurried out the door to follow the angry ninja. May turned back to the others in the room, until all of this has been sorted out we'll be suspending our operations. We can't make any plans until we know for sure who is leaking out information to Yugura. There were nods of agreement from everyone in the room, it was upsetting that they would not be able to do anything but until the traitor was found they could not afford to act. Just then a young Chunin burst through the door, Turumi-sama. The town of Gokiwa is under attack by Yagura's forces. What? May demanded in surprise as she stood up, Gokiwa was one of the towns where the families of the bloodline faction lived. Because of the offensive they had taken the town was only lightly guarded. Damn it, she turned to Chujuro, we need to send aid immediately. Take four squads with you. I'll go as well, Erisher said in a determined voice. May looked at him in surprise, Erisher. They'll need all the help they can get, and you know how good I am, he said. May worried her lips as she deliberated, he had not yet given her a reason to doubt him, yet she could not let the possibility that his Hisagi was right go. In the end, she knew he was quite possibly one of the strongest people she had on hand and they needed that strength. Very well, she decided at last. You are to go with Chujuro and lend aid to the town. Ma'am. Erisher said, before he looked at Chujuro. The two of them shared a quick message of understanding and nodded. They ran out the door to get a squad together while May stood there looking worried. 
Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like, share and subscribe. This is Raven Sage signing off.